There you go, Steve. The chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We will begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Dillon Maxfield. Present. Ms. Sarah Marshall. Here. Mr. David Sloboder. Here. Mr. Vince O'Connor. Here. A quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is uh, Ms. Christine Brestra, Planning Director, and Mr. Rob Wachilla, Planner for the Town. Rob will be the principal staff person for the ZBA going forward. He comes to us after working at the Planning Department in Ware. Uh, welcome, Rob. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, we anticipate that Rob Mora, the building commissioner, will join us later. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A, in Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority, the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional to gather additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address for the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed in the town's clerk, with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Um, I also want to note the presence of Rob Mora, Building Commissioner, who just joined us. Tonight's agenda, public hearing ZBA FY 2023-14, The Spoke, LLC. Request for special permit under Section 3.352.2 of the Zoning Bylaw to change the use of a building located at 1 to 11 Prey Street AKA 15 to 33 Prey Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002, from a three space commercial building consisting of a bar, general cleaners, and a laundromat, to a single space commercial building consisting of a nightclub, and request for the special permit under section 5.042 of the zoning bylaw for live or pre recorded entertainment. MAP 11C, parcel 274, BG, General Business Zoning District. <laughs> That'll be followed by the public meeting and discussion of the application. There'll be general comment period from the public on matters not before the board tonight, other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours and adjournment. 
So the first order of business is ZBA FY2023-14, the Spoke LLC. Request for a special permit under section 3.352.2 of the zoning bylaw to change the use of a building located at 1 to 11 Prey Street, AKA 15 to 33 Prey Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002. From a three space commercial building consisting of a bar, general cleaners and laundromat to single space commercial building consisting of a nightclub and request for special permit under sections, uh, special permit under section 5.042 of the zoning bylaw for live or pre-recorded entertainment. Map 11C, parcel 274, BG, general business district. Are there any disclosures? Yes. Um, yes. Vincent O'Connor, um, I filed this afternoon in the town clerk's office a disclosure that the, the owner of this building is also the owner of the residential units, uh, unit in which I live, Mill Hollow Apartments. And I don't believe that will have any impact on my ability to hear the matter before us in a fair and impartial way. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. <laughs> so noted. Um, we held a site visit of the Northern Disclosures. We held a site visit on Tuesday afternoon. We entered the building, observed the space, the doorways, windows, observed the planned layout for the space, <laughs> including the dance floor, the staff room, storage um, next to the staff room, as well as the bathrooms. We had a discussion about the noise abatement measures proposed by the applicant. We went outside to observe the exterior of the building, survey the parking situation, saw the location of the two sheds to be built where the delivery vehicles and trucks, trucks would also operate. We observed the property lines where the fences would be located and discussed the raised curb or threshold on Prey Street. Other questions that were asked during the site visit. It was asked what the space in the attic would consist of. It was asked if buildings, if businesses would be open at 8 p.m. or after the anticipated time of opening for the nightclub. Those are the other businesses in this, uh, along Prey Street. Does the abutting bank have an agreement to let the Spoke Live use their parking spaces? Do the abutting Jones property buildings have or Uber ride share traffic lining out in front? Um, <laughs> There was mentioned that the town parking lot will be used by employ will not be used by um, uh, spoke employees. The employees of the abutting businesses in Jones property uh, usually park around the uh, around until about 5 p.m. was a representation of the applicant. It was asked where the handicapped access and parking center. The raised curb was identified as potential tripping hazard or concern, and we asked how the applicant would address this. We wanted to know, it was asked what the cubic feet of air moving through the ventilation system is, and does it meet past COVID, post COVID standards? We asked what the average height of men and women in the US are and how many students at UMass are over 21. I think there's, that summarizes pretty completely the questions and observations we made. Is there anything that anybody wishes to add? Ms. Marshall. I would say we talked about the queuing outside also. Good, yep, good point. Thank you. And I, I believe um, I, I believe I asked yep. whether there were um, the, um, any solar um, activities planned for the building. Correct, good. Thank you, those are good additions, I appreciate it. Um, I wanna go through the submissions we have received. Um, First, the submissions from the applicant. We've seen a ZBA FY 2023-14 ZBA application uh, management plan with the attached addendum, including additional information required for restaurants, the lease agreement between Jones Property and the Spoke, a sound analysis conducted by Bill Forbes of SPL Systems with recommended improvements to the building. Um, been a submission rendering of the signs that will be placed on the north and west elevation of the building, a screenshot of the sheds that will be placed at the rear of the property, an image showing a palette of colors, choices for roof shingles, combined site, floor, and elevation plans prepared by Fitch Architecture and Community Design. Um, those include sheets one, 0.1, 0.2, sheet A.1, 
1.1, sheet A 1.2, sheet A 1.2.1, 2.2, 2.0, and 2.0. Planning staff submissions include memos from the design review board, previous uh, decisions pertaining to the applicant, ZBA FY 1984-64, ZBA FY 2001-33, ZBA FY 2008-18, and ZBA FY 2012 ART 14 decision document. Those are all for 35, East, 35 and 37 East, uh, East Pleasant Street. Zoning amendments uh, passed on December 19th, 2022. Updated section 3.352, updated section five, updated article 11, and updated article 12. In addition, we have some um, town um, documents sent to the staff uh, that are noted in the record. Uh, one, a letter from Scott Livingstone, the chief of police, a letter from Carl, from Captain Chris Bascom of the fire department and a letter from town engineer, Jason Skeels. I think that is all the information, all the submissions that we have. Is it not Rob? Okay. There also was some um, supplemental materials oh, yes. that were sent as well. Yes, we had, we received something from the university of Minnesota, uh, university of Massachusetts, which includes um, conversation, uh, email, um, conversation between Planning Director sorry. Brestrup. Uh, my Apple Watch is talking to me. I'm sorry. Uh, email information, email conversation between uh, Planning Director Christine Brestrup and Nancy Buffon, uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for University Relations regarding the age of UMass students. I think that's it, right? Good. Ms. Marshall. Sorry, was that last piece, that communication from Ms. Buffoni? Was that Ms. Sent just to Ms. Brestrup? I don't recall seeing it. Did it? I think it got, I received an email this afternoon with that information. Okay. Double Wait, check your, your, Okay. double check Sorry. your mid-afternoon, mid uh, Ms. Brestrup. Okay. I believe there was one other piece that um, went to us that uh, we sent out to you and it had to do with a question that was asked about um, parking in the downtown, how many spaces there were available oh, yes. and how many spaces were um, permitted to um, a few of the different um, buildings downtown. So you should have that in your email as well. Yep, that's yep. exactly right. Thank you, Yep, you did receive that, okay. If there's no other uh, comments regarding um, submissions, we'd like to look at uh, who's representing the applicant. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, I'm representing the applicant. I am the applicant, Chad O'Rourke, um, Six University Drive, Amherst, Massachusetts. Great. Go ahead and make your presentation, Mr. O'Rourke. Uh, thank you. Uh, so what uh, we're, we're proposing to, um, we're looking to, for a change of use of the building uh, from, as you had said, from a, for what had been for years, a bar, general cleaners and laundromat um, to a change of use as a nightclub. Um, we are looking to operate this business uh, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and a, a, some Sundays during the school year. Uh, it is a business that's favoring the student, the general student population that's there. Uh, as indicated, I currently own the bar located at 33 to 37 East Pleasant Street, which is the spoke. This would be um, sort of an extension of that premises. Uh, it is a separate physical building, so we are applying for a separate liquor license, uh, but we would be using the same name. It would be supplementary to our existing um, bar at the at located at East Pleasant Street. Um, and we are doing so uh, because during the seven years I've owned it, um, I've expanded uh, twice in that building. I took over the, the existing bar in 2017. Um, it was located in the middle of three businesses in that building. Um, we were uh, adjacent to us was Amherst Southern Pizza and Amherst Copy. Uh, we, uh, in year one, we expanded into the Amherst Southern Pizza side. During COVID, we expanded over into the Amherst copy side. And, and at that point, we had created a, a nightclub. Um, half the building right now in the, up there is uh, a tavern side, and the other half is a nightclub. 
And with the success of that and the um, what's been happening in the town of Amherst with our with our bars and nightclubs and, and you know, sort of lack thereof, we've made the decision to try to expand yet again and be able to utilize the adjacent building to us to take the concept of what we call Spoke Live, which is the nightclub, and be able to expand it into that building next door, giving us the ability to separate um, that the the two different styles of of uh, of a, a pub tavern and a, and a nightclub and be able to separate them into the two different buildings. So again, we're we're seeking approval from the zoning board to uh, for change of use of that building located at one through eleven Prey Street. To that, great. Can you uh, walk through? That's your purpose. That's we understand that. Can you walk through the uh, plan changes you want to make to the building? Um, yeah. Some of the things we talked about on the site visit, including the sound abatement, the yep. layout, et cetera. Yeah, so the layout of it would be that of a, a nightclub, like you had indicated. Uh, half the building would be a, a, a larger open room, um, which would consist of a dance floor in the bar area. And then the other half of the building would have the, the back room, the storage, the, the restrooms. Um, and what we would what we would be proposing is everything we're doing, we, we know that the, the major topics of conversation are going to revolve around noise control, crowd management, um, queuing, stuff like that. It's all stuff that we've um, learned and done for seven years in the existing building that we have. Um, our, everything we're doing, the renovations that we're doing to the building um, are all done for purposes of sound reduction to meet the requirements of the town of Amherst to, to bring the decibel rating to 70 decibels or lower at the property line. Um, the renovations include, so it is a, a brick faced cinder blocked structure of a building. I'm sorry, go ahead. What I, you know, what I think would be helpful, sure. a good description, be helpful if we could have a, a picture of the uh, floor plan. Um, Rob, can you share your screen or so ch you can point to this, Chad, then we see exactly what you're talking about that might be easier and, and also more informative to the public. Sorry to break up your presentation oh, there, but that's perfectly uh, okay. Yep. Can everybody see the plans? Okay, Rob, can we? Yep. Do, so mm -hmm. it, actually, if you want to, Rob, right now, if you want to stay on that page, because we we can look at this right now from an external perspective, and then okay. mm -hmm. we can go to the next page, and that would give us more of a, an internal perspective. Um, so based on the plan that you see in front of you, um, that that's the proposed new building. The existing building would be to the bottom right corner of this picture um, over there, right there. The, those those are our two parking lots right there that are the back side of our building. And then we would have the parking spaces that are in front uh, of the new building. So there's 33 parking spaces total amongst the the uh, the two buildings there. There isn't a down, we're in downtown, so there isn't a parking requirement. We do have the benefit of having parking, which is a huge benefit. And there's also the bus stop that's uh, right there at the front of where the, the bank building is. For anybody that's familiar, it's the upper right corner is the is the bank building there. Um, so from again, from an exterior perspective, the, the things that we're working on, we're, we're proposing to do uh, behind our building uh, um, up top of this picture is the new development that's going on downtown uh, with the with the building, uh, the apartments that are there. We share the property line with them. They are going to be putting up their own fence perimeter uh, to separate the properties, and we would connect to the back of that at the back side of the building. Um, for years, the the carriage shops was there, the uh, Amherst Pub was there. There were these dark alleyways and these kind of nooks and crannies in that back area. Uh, that's all going away uh, with the new development that they're doing back there in conjunction um, with what the Jones Properties has done in, in their corner of the Jones owns these two buildings here. That's that that one there. Uh, which is our proposed new building and the one to the left of it on this picture is the existing Jones building that 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 parking area in between the two buildings for years was sort of this black hole area um, and so now uh, with all the development going on and what we're doing we've 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 cleaned it up and we've taken it back uh, it's it's well lit over there there's cameras over there that's the area where we currently have the um, trash and recycling and we would continue to have that over there that's picked up weekly by USA Waste, and, and it's the same company we use at the front building uh, for services. 
that would all be fenced in all the way over to the to, to meet the, the fence that is the cemetery behind it. Um, what that creates is um, an area that doesn't give anyone purpose for going back there. Um, we would take control of the backside of our building. Jones is taking control of their building. Like I said, we've well lit it now. We've cleaned it up back there and that's given us a, a, a nicer area. The front side of the building has a walkway, a uh, 72 inch walkway along it. It is a little bit wider at the bottom left corner there where you see the curvature of the sidewalk um, that just follows the contour of Prey Street. Uh, that's 15 feet wide at its peak. Uh, this, there's an awning at the front of the building as well. Um, so the sidewalk is twice as wide as what it looks like on the diagram here. Um, and it's like I said, it's a 72 inch walkway that runs along the front of the building. It's a private walkway. Um, the public walkway is located directly across Prey Street from the building. So that sidewalks that are there. And then our, and then our sidewalk will, will, does wrap around the side of the building. So looking at it from this perspective, the right side of the building is the main entrance. And then there's three exit points at the front of the building, which are 72 inch um, double door, no muyan um, egresses that would allow for um, safety, obviously. Um, and then we were we proposed uh, to have two sheds uh, in the back area and within the fenced in area. We use those for storage purposes. The one that's on the upper right corner there would just be our dry goods, uh, extra cups and stuff like that that we use on a regular basis. The one that's closer to the dumpster side, um, obviously being a, a, a tavern, a pub tavern, we have kegs and empties and rags and other things that we need to operate that are uh, picked up on a weekly basis uh, for service, for exchange and stuff like that. That's the what we would use that shed for um, to keep that in. And that would give access to our distributors and our vendors that we, that we work with to be able to get back there. Um, deliveries would come in from that side. There's a back door which you'll see on the, uh, the plan, the interior plan next, um, that allows for delivery drivers to get back there, park their vehicle in one of those two spots on the side of the building or both if they need to, and be able to deliver from um, right into the backside into the employee area without ever having to go through any public area. Um, and then I'm trying to think what else is there, while we're on, is there any questions at the moment by anybody that, I know you guys aren't, you're probably not at that point. Do you want me to go over anything else on the, exterior aspect of this while we have this open while we have it up can you just show us where the the lights are i see some i see two in the front of the building but and the light pole but just run through the lighting yeah so the the awning that front awning that runs along the sidewalk there's 12 led uh can lights that are built in underneath that awning it, it's very well illuminated all lighting was existing done by by the Jones. It's all LED. It's all downward facing. You know, again, I, I've been in this town for 22 years uh, as a business owner and uh, in conjunction with Jones Properties. We understand the requirements of downward lighting and, and all of these having those considerations and and everything we do with the buildings. The um, all four corners of the building are um, already illuminated with LED floodlights, downward lighting that illuminates all the corners. The egresses have um, lights over them as well to, to light up the, the egresses. And again, down that awning uh, has the can lights built into the, the top side of it that illuminates the entire walkway. And it's 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 very well illuminated, it's very safe for sure. Thank you. Is there okay. any anything else that you want me to go ahead for the exterior at the oh, moment? That sounds good. I see no other. Hi, Chris. Oh, Ms. Brestrup. Yep, Ms. Brestrup. So I just You're wanted good. to know yeah. if, if can uh, you point out where the handicapped parking space is going to be? Yeah, so that where, where his arrow, is, that, yep, see the white arrow that's on that picture? Oh, that's my white arrow. So the black arrow right there that he has right in front of that arrow, that very last spot um, where these two sidewalks come together uh, right there at the front right corner of the building, that is where they come down on slope to be handicap accessible. And that first spot is large enough um, for a handicap accessible spot. And then we have one on each of the other parking lots. We have handicap accessible spots as well. Okay, you can proceed, Mr. Yep, go ahead, Chad. Okay, so if you if, if you want to, yep, if uh, Rob, if you can go down to the next layout here, I would actually even. Do we have a? If you go to the next one, is there a better? I mean, I guess that one. Yeah, this one might be confusing. Do you guys have a preference of, of which one you'd like to view of the two? That's, of these? This that's better right there. You like that one? Okay. Yeah, that's I find that better. 
so yeah, so looking at this one, um, again, as you, thank you for uh, zooming in, Rob. So the main entrance of the building would be there on the side. Uh, that would be an entrance only point. And then the three front 72 inch doors would be an exit only point. Uh, the way we manage and operate the business, if you leave through those exit only points, you are not allowed to return in at that point. You must go back into the front. That gives us complete control and management of, of everybody uh, coming and going. We do, we run a very tight system. We, we have for years, again, in seven years, we've never had an ABC site, ABCC violation, police violation, anything for underage drinking. We have no tolerance for it. We are very strict about it. All our employees are trained that way. Um, you are not allowed to work for us uh, as a doorman unless you are a crowd manager, CPR and first aid certified. You are not allowed to work for us as a bartender or a bar back unless you are TIP certified. And we do ask that they get CPR and first aid certified as well. Um, so all our staff are, are professionally trained. Um, we don't hire just anybody off the street. And like I said, we, we are very strict about how we manage our, our queuing, our lines, our patrons, everybody. We use a scanner system by ID Science, which we have for years. Um, I think it's become the standard in our community for all uh, alcohol service based places to use. We scan everybody at the uh, at the front door there. It helps us keep a database of anyone that comes in. If there was an incident, it also helps us to eliminate somebody if there uh, was an incident in, in the past. Often um, us us bar owners in the community, we do communicate with each other. And so if there's an incident at one venue, that um, with, with a particular patron and we want to ban them from our venue, we can simply go in with their name. And if they ever tried to get in and scan their ID, it would automatically pop up and indicate that they're not allowed in. So at that main entrance point, the reason we do it that way is because of that. It gives us a tremendous amount of management control of, of the patrons coming into the building. Um, so at Mr. that point- Mr. O'Rourke, we, we got a question here from Ms. Marshall. Yep. She has her hand raised. Oh, thanks, I could. Can you hear me? I'm unmuted, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. All right. Um, so I have a question about doors. The main entrance, perhaps it's, well, it's the only entrance <laughs> for patrons. Um, and maybe it's just the scale here, but is that wheelchair accessible? It looks pretty narrow. Yeah. It's 44 inches. Yeah, it is. Okay. I think it's just based on the drawing. If you look at the double doors, those are 72 inch doors. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I think it's the, probably the ratio of what you're looking at on the picture. It's obviously hard to see it on scale, but those that is a 44 inch uh, entrance door. Okay, thank you. And then the exit door into the back, I know if you want to call it an alley, but behind the bar there. Nope, nope, that one, yep. Is that also an emergency exit? 30, yeah, those are 36 inch doors. They, that would be, um, that's for purpose, to be honest with you, the reason that's in and the only reason it's gonna be left in, it's, it's, it's sort of going to be hidden amongst the backside of the bar. But the reason that's there, again, living and learning and lessons I've had, and I've owned three bars in my life, um, equipment behind the bar can often be very big. And sometimes it's very hard to get things like kegerators and refrigerators and those type of pieces of equipment that we use in the bar business in and out from behind a bar. And so that door has been purposely left there for ability to be able to remove uh, or swap out equipment. And yes, it would certainly be able to be used under cases of emergency to be for our staff to be able to go out the backside. Same thing uh, um, with the other door you see in the picture there mm -hmm. from the employee room. Um, that's that we we're, we've designed that that way from a couple of reasons. One, to be able to allow the employees to separate from the general public. So coming and going, um, as you as you probably can imagine, at sometimes a busier night as we have staff overlap and come in at different hours. Um, it, it's easier for them to come in the back door, be able to put their personal items down safely somewhere, lock up, get ready, dress, whatever they have to do to go out into the working world out there without having to go through the, the front entrance and, and deal with the general public. So that's why that that door is back there. Also, that allows our delivery drivers to be able to come in, go straight into the walk-in cooler, which is right there to, to deliver the um, kegs and, and bottles and any other alcohol-based beverages or anything that gets stored in there. Um, we do have an employee bathroom proposed in this, which is, which is great. Again, separating our staff from the general public, allowing them to use the restroom if they need to and get right back to work is an important feature. Um, and so that was, that's something that's built into that back room. Um, and so, did, did that did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I just I just was hoping it's not like 
dead bolted, but th so there'll be crash bars to open those doors yeah. in an emergency? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Every door, I mean, the main entrance door, of course, is going to be crashed, a crash bar. If there was an emergency, we want to get everybody out any door, the, the closest door possible. So again, outside the realm of an emergency under general functions of the business, we will not allow anybody to, to exit that point at the main entrance. It would be exit only at those three egress doors. Upon emergency, you would be able to exit from the closest door in any direction and every one of them will have the push uh, lock style um, door. Nothing would be dead bolted. Um, so yeah, so from egress perspective, that's exactly how everything would function. Is there, so go, going back to that point, so the main entrance there would take you into the, the main room, the dance floor area. Um, as in, again, this is an open, uh, open dance floor area, no tables and chairs. The, the design of this, again, is safe, simply safety perspective. Uh, as much as it seems as though it might be nice to have tables and chairs in a nightclub, they do become hazardous. They become tripping hazards. They get thrown around, moved around, thrown on the floor. Um, they are they are uh, more of a nuisance than a benefit. And so we've designed this uh, with that floor plan in mind to not be not have them around and have an open standing area, which is easier to manage. It's safer. Um, and so the bar is a nice long bar that wraps around the perimeter of the of the room, giving access to various points, we would have as many as eight bartenders working there. Um, and then the, you know, talking about the egress doors and, and how we manage and how we've always managed, we have um, mandatory, we have two doormen at the front entrance, and then we have a doorman staffed at each exit door that are not allowed to move. And so in addition to that, we have, we have uh, two to three doormen uh, functioning inside that are allowed to move. And then we have uh, one to two doormen functioning outside to regulate our line and make sure that we uh, are controlling our general population outside. You know, obviously being in Amherst, one of the things we learned really quickly is that we are as responsible for our patrons that are outside of our building as we are as our patrons that are inside of our building. And so one of the things that we do is we um, we make sure that we monitor and and take care of our, our lines and our property at all times, that there's no incidences outside, that everything's under control, that we don't have sound issues. Of course, you know, that is one of the major concerns of, of this space and we understand that. So again, you know, with the soundproofing aspect internally, everything we're doing is with that in mind of how we can mitigate the sound uh, at, um, from the inside out. And so um, again, from the management of our doormen, we have somebody that is, that is look, is stationed at each one of those exit egresses, two people at the front entrance working the, the scanner system and, and checking IDs and making sure all that's done correctly. Our exit, um, our exit door staff are there to help patrons make sure they get out safely, open the doors, make sure they get out into the public way and, and, uh, and onto their, the way, the direction they wanna go. Obviously um, when leaving this building, the general direction is either gonna be heading towards East Pleasant Street or heading towards College Street. Um, and there is a private sidewalk in front of our building, which they could follow all the way down in either direction to the public way on East Pleasant Street or to the public way on College Street, or they can cross over to Prey Street, at which point they have public access to uh, both of those roads as well. Um, so going back to inside and, and, and managing that aspect of things, uh, before we start really talking about internally, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to blend the exterior stuff with the interior stuff, which would be egress and in, in, um, in management of, of the patrons. So again, we, um, at the end of the night, when, when, um, when we're closing and we're asking everybody to leave, we open those doors. Our doormen are, are trained. They currently do it to follow our, our patrons out, make sure everyone uh, of the general public is outside of the building and then moving on. We We've always had it uh, as policy that we do not allow congregating uh, in and around our property. Um, our doormen follow everybody out. They ask people to keep moving along and then they always um, circle the perimeter of the building to check for things like trash and patrons and people that are around and make sure before they go in and they do their, their, their nightly requirements of closing down that everything on the outside of the building is buttoned up. Um, and then at that point, they'll go back in and they'll help the the bartenders and the barbacks and those staff members inside to, to do the, the duties that they need to do inside. Um, and, and that's something we, that's the way we function for seven years, even as the little 1700 square foot bar with one entrance and one exit that we were before to what we've become. Um, that's 
that's the way we've we've always managed. Um, I used to own a, a, a music bar in, in Sunderland, and you know that's you know the management of of patrons and live music, and and, and we we learned all that from from that business years ago. Um, so returning to to inside, uh, you've got the layout there of of the bar and the big room, and like I said, there's two uh, bar backs. There's uh, eight bartenders. Uh, in the in a general night there four on each side of that um, as you go up and down the bar there four on each on each side of the corners um, and then on the lower part of the the floor plan of the building there that's a, a 60 inch egress hallway that would give public access down to the two um, bathrooms the apparel room that's in the, the bottom corner over there is not something that would be open during the the uh, general hours of the public. We sell a tremendous amount of uh, apparel, t-shirts, hoodies, hats, um, anything that we can put our logo on, we try to. Um, and so they, I'm, I'm sure that you've seen them around town and, and, and other places. And so that would be an apparel room where we would store things and um, and allow us some, some space over there because we need it. And it, it sort of uh, was done on purpose because we kind of had this dead area of the hallway and the last thing we want is a dead area where anybody can hide and hang out. So we created that room for storage for the purposes of, of trying to utilize that space without making it an area for the, anyone to congregate. Um, and then the nice part is again, with an exit only there, the door being located across from both bathroom entrances, that doorman has the uh, ability to regulate a, a line for bathrooms or people leaving, you know, often people on their way out will visit the restroom first and then head out. Um, so we do expect that 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 part of the uh, exits are, are used often right there. Um, and so that person would you simply be, have to monitor that door and be able to monitor the bathroom. So it's nice because we do have a staff member that will always be able to monitor those bathrooms. Um, and then again, looking at the bathrooms are what they are. The, there's 11 um, stalls in the women's room, two handicap accessible stalls in that that one um, and then the men's room would have nine urinals and two full handicap accessible stalls as well um, and then so mr o'rourke we yeah. can you do me a favor just yeah. identify i i only count nine nine stalls in the women's room oh, um, maybe and i room. noticed that it says and i noticed that it says you need 10 so I, i'm assuming you'll you'll comply with whatever the state requirements are but yeah. i only come up with nine yeah, we would. Um, we of course, and you know, going back to the requirements of of what we would have to do for inspection services. Obviously, anything we do in there is going to go through the permitting process, and and we're going to have regulations through um, through Rob Mora's uh, his whole office. We're gonna we were gonna deal with Chris and and Jeff over at Fire and deal. You know, we're, that building's going to be fully sprinklered uh, as required. So all those all those requirements of permitting process will will obviously um, be done i you could be right with the nine bathrooms on there i thought yeah i just i keep counting and i keep counting nine but um yeah i feel like we, we have a you know, floor plan on that one on on it um but yeah that but that might it, be the right layout it's it's a handicap accessible stall yeah so you walk in and then it would be um i guess on this would be seven or six yeah, you're getting seven stalls of, re of regular size and then one fully handicapped accessible one at the at the very top there. Um, and then the yeah. men's side, it would be, uh, you know, just kind of the flip to that. You would have the, the urinals as you walk in and then two fully handicapped accessible stalls at the end. Got it. We can talk to Rob later on about the, yeah. you know, making sure that that comports with state and local law. Okay, sure. And that's part of the um, again when we go through the plumbing inspection, um, and I and I work with the plumbing inspector. That's that's something that'll be um, you know checked yep. on and by him, and then of course uh, for final inspection purposes with David Cody or David Wiskavitz or whoever I work with in that. Um, and then back in the um, employee side of things, so the employee back room is designed for um, as much storage as possible. Uh, at, you know, what we've got shelving that runs along. If you look at the the layout of the what's what's called the employee back room there, right in the middle, um, that has a, a running along the side walls uh, all the way down and, and around are all storage areas, dry goods, um, liquor shelving, storage, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
as much shelving needs as much shelving as we can put in because the one thing we always find is there's just simply not enough. Um, so we will we will utilize those walls for for storage. Um, we have the entrance point there of the walk-in cooler. It's a 20 by 10 walk-in cooler. It's very large. Again, um, you know, one of those things where we try to utilize the space that's there to create as much usable space as possible. Two large ice machines, um, a utility sink, uh, an employee bathroom at the end, and then to the right of that employee bathroom in the picture is our is where our water tanks would be. Um, that little storage area that you see that's uh, straight ahead there by the back door, their water main comes in right there. So, um, and it's exposed in the best way to um, safely tuck it away from anybody being able to hit it or doing some is making a closet there. And again, um, for us, it's just general storage. We can never have too much of it. So that's a, that's sort of a generic storage closet there with the water main tucked into it. Um, and then there's an electric panel back there to the right of that rear egress door. We have two electric services that come into the building. Uh, the first is that one right there in that employee back room to the right of that door. And then the other door of which we were talking about earlier on, there's an electric panel um, just to the side of it in there as well. Um, that's in the bar, the main nightclub side. Yep, right there. And that'll be built into the, the back side of the bar. It'll be, it'll be hidden. Um, but there, like I said, there is two electrical services that come in. There's one gas service that comes in. That's on the very back side, left side of the building. Um, it comes in and it goes right up into the attic and it services our, our furnaces that are up there. Um, it's the only thing that's serviced by gas um, from a utility perspective. Uh, there's three gas furnaces. Right. Go ahead. I, just, I noticed Ms. Marshall has a her hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe before we get up into the attic, um, I, I assume that as patrons are entering, their IDs are getting checked, that someone is counting how many yep. folks have entered. Does that yep. mean all these doormen at the exits are also counting how many are departing so that you have a up-to-date capacity? Yep. I mean, yep, they, all yeah. they all communicate with each other. Yes. So, sorry, go ahead. No, that, that was my question. So. Yeah, they all communicate with each other um, for, for exactly that purposes, uh, so that we know how many people uh, exit, then they communicate with the, the front doorman that allows us to know how many people we can let in at that point. Um, one of the things we're actually working on this year, which we, we hope to get in place, is a software that will allow us to do that uh, through an application. Um, it's crazy to think that in this world of everything at um, um, my wife's in the back saying that we're, <laughs> we're using one, um, but we're trying to develop our own because it is kind of crazy in this, this day and age, uh, with this business that there's not just a go-to application that allows that function. And it's something that we've lived and learned through many years. And again, we've owned three bars and, um, as we've expanded through this, and it's something we've talked about working on and, and developing is, is exactly that a software that would allow for very easy communication amongst everybody, not only the doorman, but that would allow our bartenders to know it as well. And it's something that could be integrated into our systems. We use all of our um, all of our registers are, are through Square and all of those are Apple iPad based, so they all communicate with each other. Um, and that's something that we had we had talked about integrating into there because we can do that with our scanner system as well. Our scanner runs on a on a tablet system as well. So, um, and then even beyond that, you know, talking about technology, everything's on our phone these days. So uh, we we sell we can manage our this entire business. Our thermostats, our alarm systems, our registers down to the minute of of people of what's being run through with a credit card, all under one application on our phone. Um, so it, it makes it a really nice tool from a management perspective. Um, so, so yes, we we okay. do do that, and we're actually trying to do that even better. We're we're we're, we're continuing. So you can get it. I think the question was, can you get a net number of people yes. in your place? And the fact is, you can do it by communicating the exits and entrances. Yes. Yep, and we already we already do that. Yep. Um, they, so Mr. O'Connor has a question as well too. Yep, go Mr. ahead. Mr. O'Connor has a question. Yeah, I'm. I'd like to know what um, the length of the hallway between the the end of the bar and the and the um, the entrance on I guess on the the layout that's shown here the left hand exit um, to the to the beginning of the left hand exit from the the bar from the bar area or from the previous um exit 
that's a five foot hallway. Yeah. And I wonder what what the what you believe the the length of that hallway um, is. So I don't have the exact answer for you on here, but um, okay, that's good. You can submit it later. Yeah, we can, and we can try to formulate that a little bit to, right now to answer your question. So the the building's a hundred feet long. Um, that room is is exactly sixty two feet wide. Um, so from that brick build, uh, Mr. O'Connor, when you were in there the other day, you, you did you know you noticed the the concrete wall that re, that still resides in the middle of that building, the one yeah. that goes up through the, the ceiling. Yeah. So. At, it's not quite the center. Um, they must mm -hmm. have been right. a, fire, a fire wall or something that they did. We so it, I've, I've scaled it out. Yep. I've scaled it out and it, it seems to me to be about 40, 40 feet plus or minus, but I, um, for purposes of evaluating the project, if you have a, an exact number, that would be helpful. I can certainly get that for you. So from that wall, that brick wall to the to towards mm -hmm. the apparel room that you're looking at, that's 42 feet there. Um, okay. And that, that apparel that apparel room is roughly about 10. So you know, again, in in, in trying to yeah, estimate much. here, we're about 32 feet from that brick wall to the left edge of that door. Uh, the door is 72 inches. So um, you know, you, you're talking about maybe 28 feet if that's what you're looking for. The first part of that door. If that, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Um, so from the the edge of the the floor to ceiling wall, um, you can see it's just a little bit ahead of the five oh, foot good. measurement of the width, and um, and uh, to the as you said the left edge of the the exit that's opposite the bathrooms. Yep. About 30, okay. yeah, 32 feet. I would say 32 feet there. Okay. And another question I know you had, Mr. O'Connor, that um, you asked the other day, and I, I did get the answer for you as we were talking about heading in, you know, I was talking about utilities and we we're talking about heading into the, the attic upstairs, um, the fresh air exchange. And so there's three, there's three um, current furnaces, uh, air handlers in, in the, in the building. And so those will have, um, 12 to 14 inch ducts, they have to determine the size. It's a minimum of 12 inches up to 14 inches. That'll allow for an 800 CFM um, air exchange. There's one per unit, and that would allow for six air exchanges per hour. That's more than the requirement. We would be required four per hour per the guidelines that you were asking me about. Those units will allow for six because each of them will do two um, for those. So again, there are 800 CFM intake, intake ducts on those. Right. And if you have comparisons with other, with the um, university um, uh, facilities that have uh, similar uh, situations, maybe with the, um, the uh, exercise facility at the mall um, without naming it. I think we all know what it is and so forth. So we have a, a comparison because it's always, it's important to meet the minimum requirement, but the question is, um, what, how does this facility compare uh, with other public uses um, at the university, at Amherst College, uh, the, the exercise place at the mall? So we have some sense of where your facility fits in the, in, uh, and not just with relate to the code. Yep. Um, no okay. If yeah, you could, here. if you could get provide us with that information, it will help. It will help us put your proposal in context with sure. regard to. No problem. Yeah. And like I said, the 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 minimum would have been four air exchanges per hour. Where what the units we have in there would allow for six. And um, again, for um, your perspective of of understanding the layout, the main room there, the larger room has two units in it that function for that room itself. And then the back area would has, has one single one. Obviously the design of that is we don't need as much in the back area as we we would in the front area. So so two service that front area, one one services that back if that helps too. And what and uh, in terms of the bathrooms, how is that how are those do you have air exchanges for both bathrooms? Yeah, they're vented out through it. So um, each 
above each stall goes to a, a vent system that is ducted outside the eve of the backside of the building on, on both the men's and the women's bathroom. And they're, it's tied mm -hmm. together to its own, its own duct system. Okay. And then you also had a question about um, the, the attic space again, when we're talking about up there. So I think one of the questions we, our phone call got dropped yesterday during, during the conversations of some of this stuff. So forgive me on that one, but in the attic space, the, the building will be sprinkled. Obviously we're required to, to sprinkle the building. Um, general area would be drop ceiling. You had asked that question and above the drop ceiling, obviously um, with the, the requirements through uh, the fire, Amherst fire department, um, we'll, uh, we use fire tech who does, who's did our front building and they'll do this building as well. And, and they already have it all mapped out of, of the drawing for the, the fire suppression system. And so that would be, that would of course, um, have sprinkler above and below the, um, the drop ceiling that's in there. If that helps answer your question that you had yesterday about the concern, the safety concerns of above the drop ceiling. Right. But so is it your understanding that the entire attic, the hundred foot width of the attic would be open from one end to the other? Correct. Yep. Yep. With the exception of that firewall that's there, there is a breakthrough on that firewall. I don't know if you were able to see it when you're there for the site visit yesterday. Um, directly in the middle of that, the existing firewall that goes all the way up through, there's a breakthrough at that point. Mm -hmm. And so that okay, firewall so. does carry all the way, th all the way through the ceiling. Okay. So there'll be a firewall between the bar and the customer area. And then one, and then on the, on the other side of the firewall will be the, um, employee back area, the storage area, and the bathrooms. Yeah, exactly. That's in place. We're not going to remove that that um, cinder wall that go, that's there will remain. It, it, it goes all, like I said, it goes all the way up through uh, and above the, the roof line on the outside, and that, that will remain. We're not going to take that out. Um, so uh, continuing, um, I'm trying to think of the other questions that we wanted to specifically address on the inside. I mean, that's the, that's the, I, I think I've touched on everything on the inside. Is there, does anybody else have questions? The only thing that I think we, we'd want to go through is the um, sound abatement and the, and how that, I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but yeah, you had an engineer come in, you're going to put an additional four inches of foam on all the walls. You're going to reinforce the doors. You're going to reinforce the windows. Um, you're, what about sound up through the roof? I forget what, what you're doing on that. Yeah, I'll talk to the ceiling. Ms. Marshall yep. had a question uh, before I oh. talked about that. Is there anything else? Was there something else then? Sure, I'll just, if, if you could address these at some point. Um, I saw raised in some of the documents we have a concern about, I guess, essentially maybe needing a booster for emergency radio. Yep. Communication so after, after if, if the insulation is so good, I guess that firefighters inside yep. can't communicate with firefighters outside. So how is that, that I'm sorry? I actually just learned about that today. Yep. Okay, so perhaps there's no resolution of that yet, or you just, you will have to do it if there's a... Exactly. That that is something that would have to be reactionary. So uh, with 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 Chris Bascom and and the Amherst Fire Department, um, from what I understood, what I learned today is that when the when the building is finalized, when we're going through our final um, inspection points uh, with them, that they come in and they would do a radio test for that reason. And if there is uh, electromagnetic interference or anything that would uh, take away that their their radio signals. Right. Um, the option is there is a I guess there's a booster type of system that can be installed in the building that would allow for their radios to communicate in there. I, I'm new to the, that's new to me as well. Um, and again, uh, I just learned about it today. And it, but it is something that has a solution to the problem, and that is something that when again when we go through the final inspection, we would discover at that time, and then have to resolve at that time to, okay. to meet the requirements. Of Thank the you. The other the other question was that uh, there was I assume in the fire department's report that if you have any combustion sources, you will need 
uh, hardwired CO monitors, and you mentioned there is gas. So you will be installing yep. carbon that monoxide gets, monitors. Exactly. That gets built okay. into the monitoring system. So we pay for a monthly monitoring system. We are required to. Um, so amongst the, um, the sprinkler system, we use Target Alarm. Um, they are a, a, a monthly monitoring system that regulates speci specifically to the fire suppression system. We have beacon protection for our, for our personal um, safety monitoring system. In addition to that, Target Alarm does the, the fire suppression system monitoring. So that's all tied into that, correct? And, and so the lines are generally in the in the sprinkler system of, of things. You're going to have your normal sprinkler heads that you know of. You're going to have things like strobes. Uh, in the bathrooms and the in the hallways and stuff, you're going to have your CO monitor, like you were just asking about, an alarm, a uh, smoke alarm system monitor as well, pull stations at e each egress. Um, so all those things are built into and designed into the system that FireTech does for us. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, I have a, yes, Mr. Just a couple of questions. I'm looking back at my notes. Will there at one question about the um, the main entrance. Uh, will you have metal detectors there? We use them. Yeah, we have um, we have a wand system um, that we use right now. It's by um, God. I can't think of the name of the company. It's the it's the major one. It's the company you see on all the metal detectors and the wands. We do use them currently at at the uh, at the existing bar um, and for safety measures. It, it helps us. Uh, and believe it or not, it's actually done a great job of finding nips that people try to sneak into our place. Um, it, it's amazing what those things will pick up on. <laughs> Glass nips. <laughs> that increases like, your sales. It, so, it's a profit yeah. margin. Yeah, profit believe margin. it or not, the, the biggest thing that it does for us, uh, I don't know why people insist on flushing them uh, when we provide trash cans in the stalls for them to throw them in. But uh, often when we have plumbing problems and we use we, we use Fletcher uh, out of out of Aguam, um, I have an account with them for any emergency needs that we have. Whenever we've discovered that we've had a, a emergency need of plumbing, it happens to always be a nip. And so um, it's done a world of wonders using those metal detectors to eliminate things like flasks and nips and those problems that we that you might uh, assume, you know, incur in, in this business. So, yes, we do use them, Mr. O'Connor. And, and with regard to the uh, at the beginning, you said that the this would be a, basically an operation that would be a school year related. Yep. And and then the other thing is, with regard to the build uh, to the work that's being on done in the building, uh, just if if you have from your perspective how far into the future are you looking with regard to what you're doing with this building in this iteration our uh, time how, frame, how, anticipated time frame yeah what what is your time frame for for the work you're doing you're proposing to do on this building um yeah, yeah so as you saw when you walked through it we it's pretty much just about gutted at this point we're we're getting to the point where and, and we we have the the um the permit for that for the for the for removing the stuff the building um i don't know how old it is i think it's between 50 and 70 years old so as you might imagine upon the permitting process of whatever we want to do when it comes to electrical and plumbing everything has to be replaced in that building right i understand that, yeah that was the objective but how Go far ahead. in the future do you see this particular iteration of work and activity um how, how far in the future do you is this a a 10-year project a 20-year project that yeah. what we do will last is that what yeah. you're asking yeah yeah so i have a 20-year lease with jones um and so we're you know we're hoping to be okay. here a long time um, yeah okay that that's that's sort of that's uh, useful information. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, is, is it before I be, before I go on to Mr. Judge's uh, questions regarding noise reduction and stuff? Is there was there anything else that you guys wanted me to touch on? Because that that's a big that's a big subject, which I, I'm going to go over all that with. Is there any other the little stuff that you guys had questions on? Let's move all to right. the so, let's move to the 
the sound, yeah, so sound, sound mitigation obviously you know from from the very beginning from the very design of this everything that we were doing had sound mitigation in mind and, and we had to we knew that was going to be one of the main subjects that would that would come up in this and so um the the structure of the building is cinder block uh blown in insulation cinder block foundation and that is faced by four inch um brick that alone is considered soundproof um but to beyond that um for purposes and at, at the site plan we touched on this a little bit and you guys had walked through and, and and seen it for purposes of the fact that this building is on slab um and we need to get utilities electrical other things around the building we're going to frame out a four inch uh wall on the inside uh per, the perimeter of the building um all around on, on the inside and that would allow us to bring things like um electrical through it water through it anything that we need in various areas well that also adds to the the um, noise reduction of the walls themselves so the walls the um, insulation that goes in the attic the roof itself the um the drop ceiling all that is already considered soundproof so now we have to look at the points of penetration of things like windows and doors and so the windows that are in there right now are are um, plate glass they are noise reducing but they are certainly not uh, anywhere near what we would need so um, i've been working with amherst glass and and spoke to them about what their professional recommendations would be and we um, everything boiled down to um, half inch uh, tempered glass which would uh, uh, in itself almost probably bring us down to the point of the noise reduction requirements that we need um, we work with mr uh, mr tint who would um, tint the front of those windows that a lot that uh, also adds a, a decibel reduction. Um, those th two things together will bring us down at the point of the windows um, to reduce our decibels uh, requirements to, to meet the, the requirements of the town of Amherst. We also have another ability if we need to do, go beyond that, we can add a plexiglass internal um, trim over the, the inside of the window. That, that right there would definitely get us down um, at the point of the windows. At the doors, um you know again, so, Ms. can i just I, I i hate to interrupt you and i, no, I go ahead, go ahead. But I, I just no no i just want to make sure that i understand i i i read this i thought that you were having that you had proposed to have the the, the um, plexiglass centerpiece between the two panes of glass are you saying that that's still something you're considering and you're not planning to do that unless you need to Correct. Just clear we that were, up for me. Yeah, we were never planning to do that. We would prefer not to, but of course, if we have to, based on uh, the noise requirements that we'll have to meet to in order to open this, we we would do that. And I think I don't have the exact numbers in front of me at the moment, but I think that would have added. Let me see. I may have it right here. I think those. Yeah, the plexiglass adds another 16 decibel reduction, so it's pretty significant um, between the yeah between the existing plate glass the. Um, the laminated glass panels uh, are 50 decibel reductions. The 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 tint, the absorption of the of of the of the vibrations that the tint reduces another 10 decibels. So just the the windows and the tint alone is a 60 decibel reduction in sound. Um, so that would allow us to to meet the requirements of, at the points of the of the windows. Um, and then you know looking at the doors there, I know one of the questions that had gotten asked by Design Review Board was um you know would we or, or would we consider doors with with windows in them or, or or why aren't we and the simple answer to that is is that any any point of contact uh any penetration through something like a window or door are areas where noise can get through and so yep. to 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 keep noise reduction in mind those solid core double doors that would be put in are soundproof doors um, so that right there allows us to to meet those requirements of, of, of noise reduction so that we can, you know, at the point of the property line, which is pretty close to this building, that we can meet the requirements uh, of the 70 decibels or less for the town. Of so okay. did that, Mr. Judge, did that answer? It answered, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I wouldn't want to require the, the, the polyvinyl butyl um, la laminate, but I understand well, what you're, you're saying. That's already that's already part of it. That is part of the laminated glass. The PV the PVB that you're referring to is yep, the, yep. that that is part of that is what makes the laminated glass. So that's the tint the tint is in addition. The tint is in addition to all that. Correct. But the tint the tint in the window will will the the laminated glass PV PVB windows uh, in the tint are what I want to put in. 
the plexiglass right. would be the additional if we needed to reduce it even more. Okay, so that's that's not the not the the PVB. That's just the, that's already in the glass. Got it. Correct. Okay. Yeah, the PVB are, is already part of that two piece laminated glass. That that's what makes up that half inch um, window panel that would go in. And lastly, this is a really elementary question, but I think noise is an is a very important issue here. Yep. So all these are termed in all these measures that you're taking are are referenced in terms of a reduction from some, but I don't know from what point. So this it says it's a 60 decibel reduction. It's yep. a 18 decibel reduction. What is it a decibel? What is the starting point? What are you reducing from? I guess so. I so I 100 decibels. Uh, 100 decibels would be your considered to be your normal uh, bar nightclub volume uh, at starting volume, and then at that point for live music or for uh, recorded music. Yes, for recorded music. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're not looking to do when you know we say I know live music's a relative term. Um, I, we're not looking to do live music, you know, I think when the, when you hear the perception of live music, you think of a five piece band, perhaps in there, uh, that's not the type of live music we're looking to do. It's, it's simple jukebox, DJ, that type of stuff, uh, single person, um, live, you know, music in there. It's not, it's not a, uh, a five piece band or anything along those lines of okay. going, that's not our intention. Um, and so, uh, you know the the noise reduction there again. If you look at the if you take the hundred decibel uh, rating mark and you reduced it 50 to 60 decibels, which is you know what the windows and doors would do, that right there would hopefully get us down to the 40. So it does look like we're we're not really close to being questionable. But, but again, we we mm -hmm. are trying to make sure that we have solutions to problems. Like if at the point of the windows, it wasn't that we have a solution to resolve that issue, which would be the um, plexiglass. Uh, trim on the inside of it that would give us another Got it. so yeah and again okay, we are thank you yep and, and um you know the main the main feature for us is that the the structure of that building being cinder block and brick is is a significant uh amount of of, of noise proofing um mm -hmm. around the building i mean the whole the, the the left side of the building the entire back side of the building there's no penetration of windows at, at that point at all back there so um you know you have a significant amount of noise reduction you have your, your soundproof out the back side of the building so your goal for total sound reduction or your goal for total total sound production outside the building at the property line is 60 decibels is that what your goal is yeah so at the property line or is it 50. Well, 70 is the requirement by the town of Amherst. So obviously right. yeah, that's I understand. what we're yep. going to try to achieve. Uh, and, and 60 is very realistic of what I think that we can achieve at that point. Okay. Um, Mr. Maxfield. Well, yeah, just for, um, I guess, point of reference, what is, uh, what's the noise reduction currently at the uh, spoke that's there? Uh, what do you guys get for noise reduction from from those windows? Uh, I, I don't know. We haven't done a, an analysis on that building there. Um, those are uh, tempered glass windows as well. So if you take the standard tempered glass window um, that that you would have in place, and many of those have been replaced. Amherst Glass just replaced two of them for us uh, with that. Those those tempered glass windows have a 50 decibel reduction standard in, in a half inch uh, piece of glass on those as well. The night, the the live side, currently in the the building there at the front, we do have half of it as the pub side, half of it as the live side. Um, the live side building, um, the the wall that faces Garcia's, that has no window penetration in it, so that is completely soundproof. And then we do have that noise reducing tent. That's that's how we that's how I learned about that from Mr. Tin is that we used it on on that side over there on the front of the windows that are that are on that current nightclub side. Um, I, I haven't done a sound analysis over there to, to be able to answer your question honestly, but again, if you take the basics of what we learned from this one, I would say we're probably getting at least a 60 decibel reduction at that point over there alone. Thank you. Um, is there, so again, going back to the, the noise questions and concerns, especially, you know, on the interior part, is there, did I, did I answer? Uh, Mr. Judge, what? Ms. Ms. Mar yeah, you answered my question. I might have another one, but Ms. Marshall has her hands up. Well, my my remaining questions, I think, have to do with the noise 
has to do with all the people outside. I think I'm reassured that the sound created inside the building will not cause a problem outside the building, but I do have some questions about management of the people outside and the noise that they make. So if I don't know this so is the Ms. time. Ms. Marshall, let me yeah. just ask a question on the interior sound and then we can get to your yeah. question so we keep on the same topic and we don't bounce around too much. You may have answered this, Mr. O'Rourke, but I was looking through, trying to look through the um, um, the sound analysis when you did. How do you mitigate the sound in the ceiling? Do that. Go over that for me again. Yeah. So the sound in the ceiling is mitigated by by the design of what's up there. So you have the drop ceiling, which drop ceiling tiles themselves have uh, noise reducing um, properties to them. And then you have the 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 insulation in the attic, and then you have the the structure of the attic itself. So that that uh, like okay. the physical exterior structure of the building, the the uh, along the roof line as well as all considered soundproof because there is no penetration through that roof uh, like doors and windows. So you've got foam on the roof, on, on the underside of the roof, right? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And then, and lastly, the sound that would escape from the from the ceiling and the roof. Would that be picked? I'm, I'm I'm a novice at this. Would that be picked up by sound monitoring? Because I'm thinking of the units right behind your building, the yeah. uh, apartment buildings there. Will there be um, with the sound that does escape? Will that be able to be picked up by the sound monitoring that may be required of you as a condition of the application? I mean, I, I honestly don't know. I think in most sound yeah. analysis, the sound is always done from uh, the perspective at street level, vertically, not horizontally. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, yeah. I can't answer that question honestly for you. Okay, all right, that's fair, but it's it's something I'm interested in. So yeah, and it, it, I'm putting it, it out sense. there. All right, it certainly makes sense. Yeah, and I think you know yep. a lot of this topic, as as all of downtown Amherst gets redeveloped, I think this will be a, a topic of discussion for for many businesses for sure. Yeah, Ms. Marshall, uh, go ahead with your question. I guess. Okay, thank so you. You asked your question. I guess we can proceed with that. Well, well, yeah. I want to get specific about it because um, there there are two things yes. about this project that um, are, are interesting to me, partic particularly interesting, that is you have a new apartment building going up right, <laughs> right there. So even your current operation, um, you know, the nearest residents are quite a bit further away than they will be starting this fall. So um, I'm wondering, and now you will have two queues, a queue at each of your um, buildings uh, with the road in between. Do you have a plan to prevent just like a street party starting to develop as people see their friends, yeah. you know, in the other lines or they're coming back and forth and just generally the noise of all those people and yeah, yeah and disturbing oh. the residents, yeah. Yes, I do. And, and we, and, you know, again, we, we do our best to monitor that. We, part of our employment is working the exterior of the building as a, as a doorman. I learned very early on in our COVID days when we were having to have a line out there separated six feet apart, um, we needed to monitor that. Um, I also learned very quickly that we were responsible for everything that was happening out there. So, um, at the time of, of COVID, as you can imagine, when we had a significant reduction in capacity and we at some point had the same amount of patrons that wanted to come in and we couldn't put them in there, um, that's when the, the lines thing started to really to start for us and, and we had to put spacing outside uh, um, on, the, on the walkway. We had uh, stickers that were done by Amherst Copy in circles of six feet. And, and so at that point, we started having part of our doorman's jobs of, of being outside and monitoring the line and uh, for purposes of separation and everything else. And what we learned from that is that, you know, from a management perspective, it gave us great control of everything as well. And so, like I had addressed earlier, at the end of the night, um, when, when we are closing down and we are removing our patrons uh, from our, our bar, we, we don't just open the doors and kick them out and turn around and go in. Our entire staff, and uh, you know, I think Amherst, copy, uh, Amherst police would, would speak on our behalf for this. Uh, they've, you know, they've witnessed it, they've been a part of it. We've never had an incident uh, at our venue. 
is just that we we our our staff you know so I, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go back to answering your question of of during operating hours how we do that but again the major part of that would be at the end of the night of course when when the larger crowds are are shuffled out the door and on and and my staff is is trained to to follow them out uh, and encourage them to move on and 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 go on their way down the street and it's 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 worked it's always worked and um and so you know during the hours of operation when there is a line or when there is patrons outside, we we have staff members whose sole job is to to monitor that outside and, and regulate them. And we do the best we can. Um, we have an excellent relationship with, with the Amherst Police Department. Often um, the officers will stop down at the beginning of the night, check in with us. Hey, if you guys need anything, let us know. You know, and, the, and again, Amherst, as you know, Amherst is a, a very small community. It's a very small main road. They're never far away. Um, I can tell you that when we've had incidences where we had 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 to call the the Amherst Police Department, it's almost instantly that they're there. So, um, and then the other reality we face in this community, and it's a great truth, is that these students that go to UMass, um, there's only so many options and places for them to go. And the the last thing they want to do is get in trouble. Uh, and get banned from one bar or not, or all the bars. And as I I told you before, we all communicate with each other. There's only a, half a dozen bars left in this town, and we all know each other. We all communicate with each other. If there is an incident at one, um, we all know about it right away, and we all watch out for each other. And if we have to ban somebody, uh, we usually do it together. We have done that in the past, um, and so we try to we try to be great about communicating amongst each other with that. Um, same thing with door guys, just internally, if someone goes out the back door, um, let's say we remove a patron from uh, the back door because they're being unruly or whatever reason, um, we're instantly communicating amongst all our doormen to let them know, hey, you know, hey, this person, this name, we can't always get a name, obviously, we, we, we aren't always able to get an ID, but if it's somebody, hey, red sweatshirt with a hoodie, I just had to remove them from the bar, they're not allowed back in. Our staff also rotates. So again, with the floating with the um, the floating doorman that we we staff, um, no doorman. Our doorman that are that are staffed at the point of egresses that are not allowed to move are not stuck there all night long. We have a we have a rotation. So we have um, rotate. We have the two doormen at the front. We have our, our floating doorman, and and throughout the night they periodically rotate into different areas. Uh, you know, it takes the boredom away. It takes complacency away. Um, it allows them if it's warm or cold to to warm up and 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 so on and so forth. And so that allows us to be able to um, stay on top of almost everything going on there. Um, and so, so Mr. O'Rourke, yeah, Mr. O'Rourke, yeah. So from your, I understand that's a lot of good um, um, intent to try to and, and probably a good history at the at the spoke because I haven't heard that it's a problem. But you have a potential of I as I read this 342 people queuing out in front of the of the building right now if you look at it yep. and you have how many people that will be out how many um personnel i won't call them bouncers how many people out front uh, will be taking care of that that's uh, potential two, two, 342 two. while you're yeah. waiting to open up the the yep. bar on the, the last friday night of school yep two so you got how many people out there yeah, two. It, it's it's well organized yeah. out there. Uh, we you know we we have queuing down the side of the the. It's not um it's not just a uh, a blob of of people all over the sidewalks and the streets. We don't allow that. And again, um, I mean the reality is at the end of the day, it is a pub. Pray Street is a public way. Um, there there is only so much we can legally do. Uh, so, and we try our best. But go ahead. I, I don't want to interrupt. Okay. You. So so then I guess the next question is for Rob, or for Chris. Um, so you try your best, you aren't able to control it some, some night, the police come and they try to, and they get it under control, right? What is this, what's the threshold where this becomes, um, where it's determined to become a, a, a consistent problem or something that we have to, we have to deal with? How do we look at this? Cause this is new to me. I mean, I don't know that we have another, I don't think we have another nightclub of 500 people in this town, um, or even a gathering outside from the university of. University of Massachusetts field houses and stuff, but we don't have a gathering spot for I don't think 500 people anyplace else. Where what's the tr kind of the tripwire to say you know we got to we got to go back and look at this. We've got to install some additional um, safeguards it, it, for either crowd control out front. Uh, I just you know because your two guys may not be able to do it consistently and there may be a problem. How do we look at that in the future, Rob? What do you do? So 
so, you know, first of all, I think it'd be the police department that would be responding and they're authorized under yep. the nuisance uh, regulations to, to deal with noise and nuisance disturbances. So I think they would be, you know, first to the scene and, and making decisions to either, you know, move a crowd along, uh, you know, and decide if they're able to stay queued uh, to, you know, potentially enter the establishment. You know, from that mm -hmm. point, you know, we're, we're going to be um, enforcing whatever set of conditions that, that this permit results in, along with the management plan uh, that Chad has presented. And, you know, if there's deficiencies or if there's improvements that need to be made, it's, it's a discussion, you know, that we have with, with Chad or his manager. Um, you know, it, it happens. You know, we've had these situations from time to time. Uh, Chad's very responsive uh, in, in any of the conversations that have taken place related to his establishment uh, and has sought to make improvements uh, and, and been pretty successful at it. So, uh, you know, we would use whatever tools we have in the permit and uh, rely on the police department for the, the late hours enforcement. Yeah, but if, in case there's, in, in case it comes up with that, despite all the good history and the good intentions of Spoke Live, it's a continual problem. If we haven't put something in the conditions, we don't give you the tools to deal with it. Is that right? Do we have to put something in our well, conditions? Or is there yeah. kind of a, is there, is there sort of a, a, a standard that if it, it becomes too obnoxious, there's another either bylaw or, or local ordinance that allows us to take a look at this again or to limit the, the gatherings outside? So, so we're going to try to establish as many conditions as we can that we yep. think will be effective. But then we're also going to suggest, uh, you know, similar to what I did with, um, and, and just as a reminder, the, the current spoke uh, was mm -hmm. extended, doubled by an administrative approval through Article 14. So it, it was something that didn't come to the board. But a condition that what that I put into that permit and would recommend into this permit is a review. You know, there could be a, a 12 month and 18 month review uh, so that that's kind of the last stop for um, understanding problems that couldn't be resolved in the the other ways that are available or um, you know, by the responsiveness of the, the business owner. Uh, and that's something that the board has typically done. Uh, and we can, you know, yep. we can work on the language to make sure that that works for this uh, particular situation. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Marshall, did you have your hand up? Or was... Well, I, ju I just wanted to um, maybe reiterate or clarify my concern that that part of the uh, dorm, outside, outside doormen, the crowd control folks uh, job is that, that, that people, if they want to go in, they're in a, in a line, either this queue or that queue. And there's not a mass of people chatting in the middle of Prey Street because I live nearby and I do walk and drive through there all times a day. So it, you know, it, it, it can't become like an outdoor, like a pedestrian mall it really does have to be kept clear and i just see kind of the, the possibility for it to get disorganized because there are these sister establishments you know just like mm -hmm. 100 feet apart so that's all i just i just want to know that that's that road is going to be kept clear yep i understand and, and mr o'connor oh, oh go ahead go ahead mr o'rourke no no mr mr o'connor you can you can go first because i'll address no no yeah just answer Ms. Marshall's question, then I'll call on Mr. O'Connor. So, yeah, no, Ms. Marshall, I, mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, th these are all the things that you know. Again, when we when we decided to make this move uh, to go over there, I mean, part of it, you know, in, in in being completely honest to you, part of the reason we decided to do this was that after COVID, we were hoping that more more bars would open or more places would would come back online for us because it is harder for us to manage the people outside than it is for us to manage the people inside, of course. And so, you know, the, the objective here was, well, when, when the pub went away and Old Town Tavern went away and, um, and you know, maybe some of the other establishments downtown, I mean, the, the, the crowd control of Amherst isn't unique to Amherst as, as, as anyone who's been around for a long time knows, we, we've had many, many establishments uh, over the years. And unfortunately we've lost a lot of them. Um, and part of the reason we've decided to make this move 
is sort of because we had to. And 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 it's we we the reality that we face in Amherst is we need more places for these students to be able to go because uh we don't want these massive lines. We don't want uh them congregating in, in massive uh groups in downtown Amherst. We certainly don't want them doing that in basements of fraternities or in neighborhoods of residential properties. And and the reality is if we don't give them options and places to go, that is what's going to happen. And so, you know, with, with this, it was one of our ways of trying to help a little bit and solve the problem um, because it was overwhelming for us. And, you know, and, and, it, and it is for everybody. And so, you know, if we could take the people that want to go out in downtown Amherst that create these lines and give them another place to go under management and control, it is a better option for for everybody. And so again, you know, everything we've done from the beginning of this and the design and the conversations and the meetings that we've had, we always knew it was going to revolve around um, noise control and crowd management control. And so, you know, we're, we're we are trying to put those elements in place. And I know you and I understand you guys are doing that. That's the responsibility of you guys as well is to make sure that you put those requirements in the the special permit that 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 enforce that. Uh, my personal uh, objective is. I'd like to have I'd like to own this place for a long, long time. I, you know, I, I don't I'm not going to turn around and sell it to someone else tomorrow. And I understand that as you guys evaluate this, you have to think about what's the worst case scenario of the future of the next person that may not manage it the way we manage it and, and the things that you have to put in, in place to do that. So, again, from our perspective, we are trying to think about all those things and, and how we can do it better. And I mean, that's always been. In my personal opinion, that's always been the way we function as a as a business is. We are the standard in and how can we how can we do it better and 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 make it right? That's how we've always tried to operate. So um Mr. All right, Mr. Mr. O'Connor. Oh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um yeah, as I as I look at the queuing areas one through four on the um the side of the building that faces Prey Street, um I, I've observed um high school students walking along that walkway for years. Um, I think that the, the potential numbers, uh, there's a queuing capacity um, table on the right-hand side of the building at the lower right corner of the building as you look at the sheet. Um, those numbers are just, um, from my perspective, unrealistic. And uh, I think that um, whether we have to have some kind of a public performance uh, 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 situation uh, to demonstrate or whatever, but I, I simply do not believe that in an outdoor situations, that many people can be accommodated in the areas that are described as one through four, either individually or collectively, um, uh, simply on the sidewalk. I, I think that it, it'd be nice if it could happen, if, but um, I don't believe that the, the queuing numbers are a realistic approximation of what, um, what people will will tolerate and accommodate themselves to. And I, I think we have to look very seriously at those numbers and um, and um, think about what's more realistic. This, Mr. O'Rourke, would you have part of your management plan? Uh, would you be amendable to having part of your management plan to tell us how you would deal with crowds i mean you're you're when you're going to have a large number of people sitting in uh, or standing along the sidewalk in front of your building and maybe spilling back to the other jones buildings it's going to be when the before the club is opened up probably right because then you're going to bring in the you're going to bring them to, up to 500 people into your club there may be people that are waiting outside but that that would be over the course of eight to between eight and one o'clock and you'll have some ability to move people on yep. so would your manage it would be helpful i think for Mr. O'Connor and maybe and for Ms. Ms. Marshall, they can make up their own minds on this. And for me, maybe to have amend your management plan, to say how you're going to handle that. Will you tell we're not going to have people standing 15 more than 15 minutes before opening? I don't know what the answer is for this, 
but some way to deal with um, a concern that I hear from two board members about the sort of aggregation of people out in front. And I think the time to worry about that is, is before opening. Um, and because you can move people and then to have something in your management plan saying that, you know, when we reach 200 people standing up front or 100 people standing up front, we're going to ask people to move along and come back later. So um, can you give some thought to that? And would, and would you do that for an amended management plan? Yeah. And, you know, again, I think for all intents and purposes of, of these conversations, uh, you know, part of of what we're here for, obviously, is asking permission to the board to allow this to happen in, in addition mm -hmm. to that is to have uh, you know those stipulations that put in that be put in place that that make you guys comfortable of allowing this to happen. I mean that's what we're here for. So, you know if if the board felt that that's necessary uh, to make it at a level of comfort for them, then then certainly. Um, I don't think that's unrealistic. I don't think it's unreasonable. Um, I mean these queuing numbers were done by an architect. So uh, sure. You know, um, so I mean there I, I think there would have I would, I think there should be some sort of uh, meeting in the middle of, of that. You're, 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 you know, Mr. O'Connor, you're basically questioning the, the professionalism of an architect and design, but I don't disagree with you on it. I, I get where you're coming from of, of taking that number and, and looking at the reality of the amount of people in that number. So I, I, I understand that as well. So, you know, Mr. O'Rourke, what I would suggest um, is that you be prepared to come up with that plan yourself. Don't, I'm not the expert on how, how long you want to have people out in front, although I don't think you want to have them there for a half hour and how many. And then kind of come back and come back to us, perhaps with something that says, um, you know, for the people cannot gather more than 15 minutes before opening or 30 minutes before opening, and there can only be so many people. And if we reach X amount, if they, if so many people, my bouncers move, my outdoor people move them along. That would be part of your management plan. And, you know, and the same thing during the course of the evening. You know yeah, what I mean? I that would be helpful would be, to us. Yeah, but I, I guess my question for you would be, what not that something that you guys would be the, then put in the special permit as a requirement? We would. Yeah, we'd put it in as, as a requirement, but I want to get, you're the expert, and we're not the experts. You're the experts on crowd management, what you yeah. think happens with your, your place. And, and I think it's, it's somewhat um, arrogant of me to tell you what to do. And so I want to rely upon some of your expertise and see if you can come up to something that we'd agree with and then put it in the condition. Okay. That would be my suggestion to you. Okay. Would that be something that Ms. Marshall and Mr. O'Connor, would that respond to some of your concerns? Yeah, yeah I, I would say that, that right. there, there's got to right. be um, a more realistic evaluation of how each, how, how many people can comfortably stand in each of the spaces um, for a period of time. And especially mm -hmm. since, uh, uh, you know, with school out from mid December through January, you miss a lot of winter, but it gets pretty cold out there. And um, I think your concern about how do you manage this amount of people um, and, and what is a, a reasonable amount of people for each of the queuing areas, I think is, um, again, he's the expert, let him come up with uh, his, his thoughts on it uh, so that we can evaluate them. Mr. Roth, Ochilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, one thing I also would ask of the board, if, if you don't mind me doing so, is um, if the applicant could provide more specifics for the uh, live music, which I believe is just a DJ in the booth on the top right corner. But um, in the management plan, he doesn't really address that. So I, I was wondering if the board would consider asking Mr. O'Rourke to consider amending or at least adding a supplemental description of what he's going to do in terms of managing live music and uh, when it's going to be played, um, et cetera. Uh, okay. Mr. Chairman? Y yes, Mr. O'Connor. Um, yeah. and I. Um, I'm a little concerned about an indoor environment. Um, at what point does an indoor environment decibel level tend to degrade the hearing uh, of the individuals who are in the room for X amount of hours? And there's gotta be some information about 
um, above 90, above 100, you know, whatever that that level is, we. I'm I'm concerned. I've heard expressions about concern about the outside decibel level. I'm concerned also mm -hmm. about the indoor decibel level that would um, that might have a negative impact. I'm you know I'm I'll be 82 in September. My hearing is still pretty good, um, but we don't want to be creating a situation where um, exposure to decibel levels that are not recommended um, is over a period of hours continuously um, that we we allow that. So I I I I would like to hear something from. Uh, Mr. O'Rourke about that, because I think we should be concerned about the long-term impact on hearing of decibel levels inside that may damage the, uh, the attendees hearing. Is there an indoor standard, Mr. O'Rourke, for bars? Um, not that I was made aware of. Um, again, generally, if you're taking the 100 decibel uh, rating of, of a, a nightclub um, or, uh, you know, for, for sound, um, I, I don't know. I'm not a, a medical doctor that studied long-term <laughs> decibel ratings on, on patrons. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Ms. Brestrup or Mr. Mora, do you know if there's uh, like health, health or, um, regulations on this or is there standards on indoor noise? That in buildings that govern buildings in, in Amherst or statewide. We'll, we'll have to research it specifically yeah. for nightclub setting, Mr. Chair. I don't, uh, you know, there's yeah. there's different standards for construction and other, you know, situations, but uh, for this one, I I don't know. That's fine. I, have, I had a hard time hearing you because I went too many went to too many loud rock concerts in the past. Miss um, Marshall. Yes. Um, so back to the queuing capacity, I, I have no reason to dispute the architect's um, uh, like conversion factor, how many square feet for, uh, per person. But I do want to make sure, and I just if it's in the fine print, I just haven't seen it, and I apologize, that the architect is, is not using the entire width of the sidewalk, but only half of the sidewalk because, right, they have to be able, there has to be room for other people to pass by. So, so that these calculations are not to just how, how many people can be crammed onto the full sidewalk, but just half. So if you would confirm that. Thank you. Yeah. I I, I can ask the, my architect that. Um, I I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think it was designed. You could see the dotted line that that's on that. I, I think it's indicated to be that way, uh, but I, I don't I don't know. Um, it it says that's the set. It's called awning, but I think it's the soffit. No, that might be the awning. Yeah, right. yeah right. it's the awning. Yeah, you're right. It's the awning. There. Okay. Rob, are you keeping track of some of these uh, requests for information? That we have okay thank you yep and i'll look through the recording tomorrow too to, to double check on all those conditions all right yep mr o'rourke we've uh, interrupted your train of thought quite a bit so uh, <laughs> what else would you yeah, what else would you like to um what else did you have and planned for your presentation so that we can nothing i uh, think you know again i i think that's the main subjects are, are of course, the, the noise control and, and the crowd control. I think those yeah. are what everybody's major topics were here. I think the other stuff is, is pretty straightforward. So, um, you know, so any other questions that you guys as a board have that I can address at the at the moment based on, on those, um, feel free to interrupt me all you want uh, for that. All right. I've asked a lot and I'd open it up to other board members here for, I have some other questions, but. I'd open up and give other board members a chance to ask some questions. Mr. Maxfield. Yeah, if we're, um, it sounds like we're gonna be just having a, I assume another meeting on this one. So we've got a lot of information we need. Do you think it's possible we might be able to get um, an idea or uh, some kind of measurement of what the noise level is outside the regular spoke 
on uh, a weekend night between now and if this were to uh, continue? Are you asking, are you directing that question to me? Ms. Yeah, that's, that's um, uh, to you. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm sure we could. No, I, that shouldn't be a problem at all. That could, you know, that could be a real helpful thing to, for us to judge the noise levels coming from the proposed establishment. Go ahead, Mr. Maxwell. Actually, I just, just one follow up because I know, um, so I live uh, far enough away from Spoke to be, uh, to not be considered a butter, but I'm sure by the end of this meeting, I'll be able to hear it. So the one thing I would definitely be interested in, it's uh, the noise when the door is closed and everything is closed off. So I think when, as people are coming in and out, that's obviously gonna let for, for a lot more noise to seep out, um, which that's just gonna be the nature of, of that business, but what it is. Specifically, I'd want to know what does it sound like when everything is all kind of closed up and sealed. I understand. And I would do it from, you know, we, we would certainly um, get obtain information on multiple sides of the building, obviously, because again, that side that faces Garcia's is considered soundproof uh, just by the sheer design of it um, versus the front of the building, let's say. And same thing, back building only has three doors that penetrate it. So. Thank you. That would be very helpful. Ms. Freshfoot. I wonder if um, uh, if Mr. O'Rourke could provide information on how many people are normally queuing outside the existing um, bar, the existing spoke, you know, how much room do they take up? Maybe he can show on a sidewalk um, where they where they stand and how many of them there are. And that might give a frame of reference to this new place that we're looking at and, um, you know, be able to judge one versus the other. Thank you. That'd be valuable. Um, Ms. Marshall. I noted in one of the submissions, a comment that there should be a hydrant within a hundred feet and the nearest existing hydrant is further away than that. So Mr. O'Rourke, do you have any idea if the town will need to put in a hydrant and who's respond, who, who has to make that happen and pay for it? I'm curious. Or, or whether the, the, it's not really, it's not a requirement, just a preference. I don't know. I, maybe Rob, Rob Moore can answer that more. I, I certainly would direct that at Amherst Fire Department, I would think. But with the building being sprinklered, I don't know if that overrides that, Rob Mora. Am I wrong there? It, it doesn't it doesn't override the standard that the fire department cited so you know they they've noted that as a requirement and um you know there could be alternative compliance if you know a, a fire hydrant is 20 feet further than you know what the the code requires uh but that'll be you know th these are all issues that would get sorted out through permitting uh one way or the other the fire department will be satisfied if there's a, if there's a need for a hydrant, and there sometimes that's the case, uh, relocating or adding an additional hydrant, that's done at the cost of the applicant, not the town. Uh, so that would be something that that they would be responsible for if there isn't another solution. So, Mr. O'Rourke, I had a couple of quick questions. Um, one is on the on Plan A one point one. So that's your um, that's the floor plan. There's a, it looks, appears to me to be either a door or some kind of an opening on the left-hand side, right above the apparel room. What is that? If you can just move the cursor over to the apparel room and right over there, what is that? That, that was, that's eliminated. There used to be a, a side door there for the uh, laundromat. It's no longer there. That's, that's bricked in. I, I don't know if it so was that's... on the floor plan or, or why Mark has that in there. My architect has that in there in the design, but there's nothing there. Okay. Yeah. So that does, it's not a, it's not an entrance or exit. All right. Correct. So that we have to have the, you know, we're going to have to have the right plans for the, you know, final presentation, but you pro if that's not going to be there, um, I well, think you gotta, you gotta fix it. Shows it being blocked in. It's, it, it doesn't show it as an opening. If you look okay. at the design of the other doors, the other doors have. Yeah, the other, have yeah it's weird. It has this, you know, a broken line. So, yep. 
Okay. All right. And then the other one I want to talk to you about is I'm a little concerned about, and Mr. O'Connor raised this as well uh, on the site visit. I'm a little concerned about the sort of the um, bulkhead, for lack of a better term, that runs along the sidewalk out in front of the um, your your the three emergency exits. Yep. It's I went over there today to measure it to look at it, and it's 15 inches, 16 inches above the parking lot, and it's a little over seven, seven to eight inches, depending on the you know the side where you where you measure it, seven to eight inches above the sidewalk, and I look at that and say, you know, on a clear day um, and with your bright lights, it's probably, and when people, when there's not a lot of people there, that's not going to be a problem. But if you have a lot of crowd, if you have crowds, if you have an emergency, God forbid, an emergency situation where people have to get out, that looks like a recipe for real, real trouble, um, a real disaster as people try to get out that, that, um, those emergency doors, the, the raised portion doesn't fit right in front of the emergency the doors. So they're kind of, they're off. Some of them are off the off center, and you you won't see that as you're running out. And the first person over that trips, then you've got a. I mean, you've got a soccer. You know, I think of a soccer style situation that I would hope to avoid. So that was a, the bar that existed there before must have had that same um, setup. How did they deal with? And how do you plan to deal with that situation? It seems to me that that might be something you want to talk to Jones about removing seven inches that the topper that runs along that sidewalk. Cause that, I just can see in, in an emergency situation that could really be a problem. So um, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand where you're coming from that perspective. I mean, this is something that's been designed like that for a purpose. I would assume we don't know if it's drainage or what, what the reason they did that. I, we're also going to, you know, we, again, we can only base on assumptions of why they designed this. And my, I think part of the assumption yep. would be it's, it prohibits people from stepping out onto the, the parking area because that's essentially what that is. The sidewalk is a 72 inch egress. It's, it's, it's a wide mm -hmm. sidewalk. They're not stepping out of the door and onto this area. Uh, in my personal opinion, I feel oh, there's, there's plenty of room to walk out that door and down a, a, a private sidewalk um, to to the ends of the sidewalk where they where they would be directed. Uh, no, oh. Mr. O'Connor, go ahead. No, but go ahead. Yeah, I'm. I would just say I I recommend um, uh, maybe for the board members and and for the applicant to a review the police reports on two, um, two license suspensions that were uh, um, handed out to Panda East when they, when the, before the Amherst Select Board. Uh, what happened was that there was a complaint of underage drinking. The police came in and the uh, patrons who were there um, exited the room in a big hurry. Um, and my concern is that um, anytime these, the, especially the two westerly doors, the, the one that's opposite the bathroom is down a hallway that I consider a real hazard. But the two, the two doors that are that that exit the main uh, room, um, they go out right to this real tripping hazard. And then, even if that that seven inch rise is eliminated, you then have a another seven inches down to the sidewalk. The, I think the entire area opposite from the from these doors to the street, because people are not going to turn right and left and use the sidewalk. They are going, if they're leaving this building under some duress um, of any nature, they're going to want to go straight out to the, to the, uh, to Prey Street. And you can't do that with the current uh, arrangement. That's a lot of that. There are a lot of people that are proposed to be be in this room. They are not going to turn right and left after they go out the doors. They are going to flow straight out these doors, both of the doors on the westerly edge, and 
and the, the egress from those doors to Prey Street has to be completely um, unobstructed and it has to be in such a way that, um, that there's a gradual slope that would be um, acceptable to the building inspectors so that people can exit that, the, the main, um, uh, the dancing area or whatever in a, in a safe manner. And um, yes, if you're, if you're leaving at the end of the day, no problem. But if you're leaving because of some emergency situation, um, this is a potential for people to break arms and legs and be injured in a lot of other ways that would, would not um, make attractive photographs. And I just, uh, I, I, I would urge the applicant to speak to uh, the, uh, the property owner as has been suggested and uh, maybe have the architect look how, as to how to, to make a clear path from those doors to what would be the safest location at that time of night, which would be Prey Street. Um, Mr. Mora, is there, um, what, what agency regulations govern the safe exit from a building in this situation? Who, who, is it fire department here? Is it the state building code? What governs what's considered safe in the state of Massachusetts or, or in Amherst for exit in this kind of, in, the, in this type of building? It's the state building code enforced by the building inspectors. Yep. Yeah, and is, does this comport with the state building code right now? Well, well, it does. I, you know, it has it has the wide sidewalk in front of the building. You know, I think there's you know, Mr. O'Connor's raising other types of issues that you know are worth considering um, that could potentially be hazardous, but it doesn't necessarily mean it violates the code. Uh, you know, right. by providing the sidewalk either direction with a sloping walkway to the to the public way satisfies the code. Um, but that doesn't mean there couldn't be improvements or there doesn't mean that there aren't hazardous situations under, you know, certain scenarios. Uh, so, um, but I don't think it's a code issue. Okay. Well, I guess that would be something you need to, Mr. O'Rourke, I, I would think you would want to try to address at the very least, the, if there's something you can do with the seven inches and, and come to the board to, and talk about that, uh, maybe at the next meeting, talk to Jones and see what they think. Um, I know Mr. O'Connor had a more uh, expansive concern than I raised, but I'm looking at us. I'm just looking at that, and I don't want to think the worst of all possible situations. But I just don't know how, in a bad situation, how that would be safe. Yeah, I understand that. I, I do have a concern about that. I mean, the argument would get uh, against it is it's a it's a parking area in front of it. I think that's one of the purposes yeah. of the current thing. I mean, yeah. I can't imagine Wait. you'd have to look at the downtown jurisdiction could make the same argument that says anybody that's going to Run, walk out of a, a a bar or anything in downtown is not just going to go run out onto North Pleasant Street blindly. There's all parking in front of that as well. So, yeah, but um, there's not a seven inch rise before the. Right. Seven. You don't have a seven inch rise before the street. That's that's what I, that's what I'm concerned about. That's what I saw for my concern. Miss Marshall. So I would say um, it would be too bad to create. Uh, a more likely hazard um, while trying to prevent an unlikely hazard um, by removing mm -hmm. that curb, which keeps helps to keep people from falling off the sidewalk <laughs> as they're just walking mm -hmm. as opposed to fleeing. Um, secondly, perhaps mm -hmm. part of this concern can be addressed by the management plan. That is, what are those doormen doing in the case of an emergency? Mm -hmm. No, they're not just pushing people out the door, but some of them are outside safely guiding people, you know, to a, to a safe, uh, to a safe exit. I think that, you know, you do raise a good point about 
not creating an additional hazard. Which is why but it's, and, and I, a railing perhaps would make sense, you know, that would keep people from coming over, from falling over that seven inch rise. That would, might be one way to address it. And I think, I think Ms. Marshall's suggestion on the, having it addressed in the management plan also makes a lot of sense. Sure. Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, um, if people have observed the results of even a small number of people in the hundreds panicking in a, um, in a, in an enclosed area, um, I mean, and there are a number of unfortunate circumstances um, that are available for discussion. Um, people who are in a panic are not going to be able to be managed. They are going to run. And, and that is why, I mean, these, this sidewalk is nowhere near as wide as some of the sidewalks in the, in the other part of downtown. And people are not going to be able to be managed by a doorman or two if there is an emergency. And, um, and therefore, we have to create a structural situation that will accommodate the emergency because um, if everything, if, if there weren't the possibility of emergencies, then the building inspector could, could be the one to permit this, such a, a building such as this. But that's not the case. And I think it is important that um, we can't plan for every emergency, but we can, we can say that in an emergency, the exit doors have to safely accommodate um, patrons who are probably not going to be walking out calmly. Is that a hand raise, Mr. Maxfield? Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> okay. uh, I think just another consideration uh, for us on this matter too. I think if we were to have it remove the, that seven inch rise directly outside of the doors where it's gonna be painted as well, I think it does create also a more clear delineation of where people are and aren't supposed to be standing uh, as well as uh, improving safety because uh, in normal circumstances in an emergency people would simply leave and go down the sidewalk but where i think in the event of an emergency people inside are going to know what that is before the people on the sidewalk do and when people come out they're going to have a crowd to their right and their left and are going to go forward into that um that seven inch barrier i think uh, possibly a railing to raise it so it's not a tripping hazard it is a possibility as well, but I think there is a, a benefit to if it can be removed just outside those doors. I think it, it, it creates a lot of benefits um, as well as a uh, improved safety. Mr. Sloviter. Uh, the, I think this is a valid uh, topic to pursue, especially in the era of guns and random shootings and who knows what, that's sort of the extreme emergency that comes to mind with all of this. I think a railing would be a terrific idea for not non-emergencies to control the movement. I That might be helpful, but if we're really talking about emergencies, uh, a railing will restrict movement. It will trap people. And for some reason, the, the incident in, I think it was South Korea earlier this year where 100 people were trampled because they were in a confined area uh, is, I don't think we want to confine the area. I think I'd rather have a few broken bones than, than crushing. I have, to, I have to comment that I'm very impressed by Mr. O'Rourke's general <laughs> answers and his his management history and the proper staffing and all of that. So there is 
there's reason in my mind to uh, to give credibility to everything that he has been saying about operations. But if we are now discussing emergency situations with with stampeding people who have just heard a bunch of gunshots. And I can't believe anybody would think that a, a gun incident is not possible. Uh, a stampede is the word that comes to my mind. And that's really what we're, we're talking about. It's, we love to think it's unlikely here in lovely, tranquil Amherst, but they thought that in Louisville and everywhere else. So uh, stampedes out of the door don't need a seven inch lip. They don't need a railing. They need safe, quick egress. I don't know, I'm not proposing an exact solution because I think a non-gradual ramp is almost as bad as a step. So I'm not, I'm not sure what exactly to do but if we're talking about a lot of people coming quickly out of three doors, we, we need them to disperse very quickly without tripping hazards. Okay. Well, Mr. O'Rourke, um, can you put your thinking cap on and talk with your architect and talk with uh, Jones? Maybe you can come back with some ideas. You've heard some thoughts here about the concerns we, I think, pretty well expressed by the board. Um, I didn't, I bet you didn't think this was going to be the issue that uh, we spent this much time on, but um, I think in today's world, it's just something we have to think about, especially when you're looking at a, at a 500, hopefully you'll have a full, you'll have a full establishment and you'll have 500 people that, um, that you have to think about. So, um, That'd be really, really helpful if you do that and come back with some ideas and we'll give it some thought as well. Mr. Wachilla. Uh, would it be okay with the board if I shared um, a list of concerns and talking points from tonight's meeting with the applicant just so he has a good idea of what to bring oh, to absolutely. the next meeting? Okay. I think we're, before we get done tonight, we're going to go mm -hmm. through a list of things that we, of, of um, ideas or questions that we have. We're going to have just so we all have, are on the same page, and of course, Mr. O'Rourke should have that because otherwise he won't be able to answer them. Uh, Bob, you can I email. You can, you can email all that stuff to yep. me. That'd be that'd be easier and better. You know, kind of the hitting points. Of this I've been making my own my own list of stuff, but I mean, again, I think we. I, I mean, I, I do think that we all kind of knew uh, the subjects that were going to matter to everybody and, and the ones mm -hmm. that we need to address the most. So yeah, but yes, if you yeah. can email you know, that, that'd be fun. Okay, that'd, that'd we'll be do. helpful. Um, one thing that I did notice, I think we've exhausted the discussion about the, the, um, sidewalk and the, the rampart or whatever we want to call it. Um, one of the questions I did have was, um, is there, a, there's not a traffic impact statement and we haven't really dealt with traffic a lot. Um, although, and I know you have an assertion in your, in your application that you don't think there's going to be a, lot, an, a large impact. Um, is that something that members of the board are comfortable with? Do we think this is sort of a common sense approach? Do you think we need to have uh, a, a traffic impact statement from um, the applicant? And I would um, like just to hear a discussion about that and then move on because if we're, if we're going to require one, he should know about it now. If we're not going to require one, I don't want to have to burden the applicant with an unreasonable um, bur uh, unreasonable task. So what do people think, um, Mr. Maxfield, did you have some thoughts on this? You, I mean, I know you're, I kind of rely upon you because I know you're on the, the uh, licensing board. You've got some experience with bars and, and I mean, not your personal experience with bars, but your professional experience, uh, your volunteer experience with bars. Um, what do you think about that? And what do you think about the, uh, the need for traffic impact statement? Um, my initial feeling is, is probably not just because I think, uh, although I definitely think spoke live is going to be, uh, a little much more busy than old town tavern was. If you consider, we already had old town tavern there and we had the pub at one point, all the spoke was still operating there. I don't think it was causing any traffic issues that I'm aware of. Um, I don't expect this to cause 
more traffic issues of people driving there. I think you're going to see, um, you know, Uber coming down there, but where Prey Street, uh, I almost feel like does get treated like a, um, it is a public way, but it is often treated as a um, kind of like a, a parking lot road. You're going in there if you're going to those businesses. I imagine most traffic would still continue down uh, North Pleasant to the Rotary um, would be my expectation. I could probably be, I, I might be able to be convinced that I'm, I'm wrong on this and we might need a traffic study, but if you're asking me, I, I don't think we would need one. Mr. Jones, can I Ms. make Marshall, a yeah, Absolutely, yes. A quick comment Mr. On, on what Mr. Maxwell touched on. So uh, ride share services, that is something that was, was brought up in here and, I, I, and wasn't discussed real quick, but just to give you guys a, a little bit of a, a answer on that. So obviously that is the, the major thing. We do not get a lot of people that drive. Uh, a lot of people walk, a lot of people use the, the public transportation and a lot of people use ride share. Uh, we do not allow uh, the Ubers or whatever the businesses are these days of rideshare to um, to stop at the main road of East Pleasant Street. We do direct them down Prairie Street for those purposes of um, and what Mr. Maxfield says where the, you know, the perception of Prairie Street has always been sort of that of a parking lot side street. It, that is the truth. Uh, that is there, there's not a whole heck of a lot of activity. I think Jason Skeels from the town would would support that. Um, and so, you know, with the ride share aspect of things, we direct them down Prairie Street for those purposes because it's safer, easier for them to not have to turn around and continue, you know, come down from East Buzz and continue down Prairie Street to College Street and around. Um, so that is, I'm sure, one of the topics that would come up in this, and, and that is uh, how we handle that. Ms. Marshall, did you have your, you have your hand yeah. up? Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. O'Rourke has a couple times said College Street. I think you mean Triangle Street. Triangle, Triangle Street, Street is, I'm sorry. Triangle yeah, Street. is yeah. on the other. <laughs> right. Yeah, not even close. Um, I, I don't see a need for a traffic impact study, but I would like to see on one of the drawing and you know, some markings for where you ask the ride shares to queue up. I'm into light, and if, you, if they're coming in from East Pleasant, you know, if you envision it as a one-way flow, um, I, I would like to see that on a drawing. I mean, it, I think you said that at that time of night, there's very little, few vehicles are parked in front of the building and either of those Jones buildings. So is it on that side, kind of across the, the, the parking spots that you're asking these vehicles to queue up? Anyway, that, that's why I think a drawing would be helpful yeah, we can, to me. So. Like I said, the parking aspect of things, you'd, you'd be, surprised to see you know in that perspective in front of the building down the Jones building of how many open spots there are at night which goes to show you the lack of, of driving which is good that's what we encourage we don't want anybody uh, leaving and getting into a vehicle so we obviously do our best to encourage the ride sharing you know that's a, a re that would could be a really persuasive piece if there was a I mean even a, a short study just of how much parking is available on a given night just from the the existing spoke patrons and clientele if there's still a lot of parking available there now that tells us something i think indicative of of the users the customers that you're likely to get but um even that would be even that if you would do that that would be valuable just to even i mean we'd have to take you at your word for it just kind of go out and take a look and do a survey but that would be valuable mr Sloviter, did you have your hand up i oh, oh wait a minute <laughs> oh I'm unmuted. How about that? Uh, I sort of did. Mostly I was just touching my face. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think that a comment that Mr. O'Rourke made uh, when we were at the site visit uh, that he the, that spoke is only open Thursday, Friday and Saturday with an occasional Sunday, perhaps, and that they don't open until eight o'clock. Uh, I have been on Prey Street at, in the evening and it's close to a ghost town most nights. It's really quiet. The business is closed. So there's sort of an inherent protection against traffic problems because no one else is there. And uh, I thought that was actually a valid point that his hours of operation coincide beautifully with all of his neighbors not being there. So 
I, I find that credible. And I, I actually agree with Mr. Maxfield that my initial inclination is that uh, a traffic study is not, is not necessary unless somebody walks down, walks there on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday and sees a problem. But I have never seen one and I've driven through there. So I'm I'm pretty comfortable that that's the case. Mrs. Marshall, you said you live in that area, so I think you probably could verify that as well. Um, by by living in that part of the community, I'm, I'm sure you you've seen that to be true as well. There. That's true. Although I must say, if I'm driving up East Pleasant, because I I, I might take Prey Street over and then up to Cottage Street. Um, Frankly, when I see so many people outside the spoke, I just stay on East Pleasant because I don't really want to, you know, drive in where maybe there are a lot of people milling about. So, <laughs> so I guess I'll, so I don't in fact drive there at least on when the spoke is um, open or at least there are queues. But yes, generally okay. it's pretty darn quiet. Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, so um, I'm familiar with the street because um, from about 2006 to 2014, I was the transportation for four um, teenagers who attended uh, and, their, and their teammates and classmates who attended Amherst Regional High School. Um, and um, so the, the only traffic I would say that will end up there is maybe some foot traffic from football games, basketball games, track and field meets and so forth, soccer, soccer games, maybe foot traffic to the buses. Just speaking of the buses though, I, I would, um, given that the, the hours, the closing hours proposed to be one o'clock, I wonder if we could, uh, if the staff could forward to us the bus schedules for the buses um, that run um, on East Pleasant Street past here that would be used. Because I, I think even university students who might come to this uh, location would tend, might tend to take the buses that run through the center of the campus. Um, so it'd be good to know when those buses, uh, I, I was the ride home last spring um, from February to May for somebody who got off of work at 11, you know, 1230 at night and lived on East Hadley Road. And so I'm familiar with driving down East Pleasant Street at this at these times and nights and how few buses there are. So it would be good to have some information about the bus service. And also if we, if we had, and I, um, in providing rides to people who don't have cars, um, I, I have, um, I've gotten occasional, yeah, I, you know, uh, I tried to call an Uber, but I couldn't find anyone. So there are times and seasons and so forth where uh, the availability of Uber and Lyft uh, activity is not, not all that great. So I, if there's some kind of way that those organizations could provide us with information on their the extent of their operations and the availability of, um, of drivers, um, it, it, would, it would be helpful. Um, I, I don't know whether they can do that. All I know is from yeah. personal experience that those who, who, who work in the healthcare field mostly, who, who do not have automobiles um, often are um, their coworkers refer them to me because they can't find an Uber when they need one. And so I think that's all part of trying to figure out. I mean, I think 
the the other members who have said that they don't think a, a traffic survey is needed, I think are correct. But I think if we're going to depend on the buses and Uber and Lyft, we need to have some parameters before us so that we can have thoughtful discussions about how realistic all this is. So um, Rob, can you get bus schedule? That'd be easy enough to do. I'm not sure how you get um, a survey of Lyft, Mr. O'Connor. I don't know how they get a survey of Lyft. Yeah. And, and, Just uh, ask them uh, how Lyft, many drivers yeah. are available in this area. But, yeah. I, I don't even know how where you go for that. Um, maybe yeah. they can figure it out. But we're, oh, we're, I don't know. You call San Francisco and ask them. I, I just don't know what you do. No, I, um, I think they have regional um, coordination. Uh, you could, I mean, there's a way to contact them. Obviously, they a lot of people contact them every day. So the question is, just do they can they tease out from the from their information um, something would be helpful to us. It's worth a shot. See what you can do. I, I think it's yeah. What's important is we, we know we can get the, we got a lot of um, information from the bus. We can get that. We might be able to get something from, from Lyft and, and Uber. If you can, it's a, it's a bonus, I think, but it's a, it may be really time consuming to try to search that out. Um, and again, I think that if the last thing you can do is, you know, if a couple of photographs over the next couple of weeks would be really helpful. It shows us how empty the parking lot is at 10 o'clock. That's just, I think that would actually kind of seal the deal, I think, on a traffic study and and um, remove that as an issue, Mr. O'Rourke, okay? No problem. That'd be helpful. Yep. Ms. Bresta. So I was thinking that Mr. O'Rourke must have information about the availability of Uber and Lyft if those two services um, are already serving his clients. So maybe he could help to provide some of that information, too. Yeah, I mean, I've never, never contacted them directly. Uh, like Mr. Judge had indicated, I don't, I don't know how you would go about that. But I mean, we as, as the, the operators of the business and, and employees of the business see it utilized often. All the, you know, and it's a service I think that uh, is readily accessible. I, I wouldn't know how to answer Mr. O'Connor's question on that because. Uh, I don't know it to not be accessible by anybody that needs it, um, you know, and, and getting the PBTA schedule obviously would, would certainly be a, uh, um, an indication to would be able to answer one, one of that part of that question, but the accessibility of, of Uber, Lyft, those, those apps these days, as far as I know, are generally very accessible. Especially, you know, if you're talking about during the hours of our operation, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, where it's not an obscure day. That's that's the day I think where they they are running the most, uh, and are the most accessible. Okay, so do we have other do we have other questions, comments, concerns, um, things that people wish to can have at least addressed in any conditions that we impose? Uh, we may impose if we decide um, positively on this application at the next meeting. I guess I just had one last thing, and this is, I think this is what you were referring to that you just discovered today, Mr. O'Rourke, but on page nine of the project application report, under the terms from the fire department, uh, from Mr. Bascom's um, letter, he talks about consider requiring emergency responder radio coverage uh, in, in accordance with section 916 of the MSBC and NFPA 72 sections 24.5. I have no idea what those are, but I would guess that that's the, what you were talking about, correct? I mean, I had it outlined for you to ex explain it, it to me, but, but um, you didn't, we, we both are in the dark, but it's the, it's yeah. the radio access, right? Yeah, well, Mr. Morrow uh, enlightened me on it today on on, on what yeah. it is and, and explained better okay. of what the system is. But that that's exactly you know what we had talked about before. It's a it's a reactionary thing once the, you know, once the sound mitigation systems are put into place and and that's satisfied. I think at that point during their inspections of to to sign off on um, from the fire department's perspective of things, that's part of the what they perform in their inspections. And if they determine it to be uh, a necessity to um to install this booster system that that it gets done 
And then the design review board had three requests that they had they made. One includes the hours of operations on the door. One talks about the uh, main entrance, uh, putting a sign on the north side of the building saying main entrance this way, pointing to the main entrance. And the last is that all trim, be, and including doors and awnings, should be painted white. Um, are you willing to put that? Is that something you intend to do? And if we put that in a condition, is that something you would do? Yeah. I mean, I know you do it if you put it in a condition, but is that something you're willing to do? Yeah, it's not something I'm not willing to do. I think during that design review board discussion, um, you know, part of the the argument to the signage thing was that it may not be necessary because the reality is, is you're going to know where to go. Uh, the the it, it was sort of okay. a, subject to put uh to put a sign that says this way to here um and then the lighting the illumination of the <laughs> yeah uh, this I'm, way to the front door yeah yeah i mean you know where you see where the line the, the queuing starts you see where the doormen are you you know you see the illuminated part yeah. I, I, don't, I don't i don't think it's necessary but again if the board at the end of of everything deems it necessary then so be it um and the illuminated signs i, I don't personally want to illuminate the signs i, I don't find it necessary to uh if the if the if, in in terms of maybe like a sign box, we could certainly put uh, a, a downward lighting over the sign. That's what we have at the the current spoke building. Our spoke signs are not illuminated per se as like a, a sign box goes. Where you think about the illumination from behind the sign, they're illuminated above the sign. Um, I, you know that's a topic we had discussed in, with the design review board as well. So they didn't specify. Uh, you know. Yeah, I don't see that as or anything. It's just sort of lighting the sign uh and i think part of the topic that came up the reality is is that um i mean people are going to know we're there i think that was one of the topics that you know so again with the design review board they they sort of left it um up for discussion for yeah that, i guess the the white trim is the agreed upon thing and the others are yeah. uh, asking you to consider it right yeah okay. that's there that's just what we're gonna i think what the the subject that came up with that one was um, you know, what do you, the, the, the brick is the brick and the, the, the roof is the roof and what, what's right. around the rest of that, what's the trim around the windows and it's white wood trim and, and, you know, the discussion was that we're just going to paint it nicely, make it clean looking, um, and, and there's nothing majorly impactful with that. That's, I, I don't want to supersede the judgment of the design review board because I don't have any sense of uh, good design anyway, so that's their <laughs> job. Miss Marshall. You have a good sense of judgment and, and oh no no or... I'm not I'm just asking I'm not going to claim claim that but um, I know there's a, a street light you know in the parking lot and there are probably some right on East Pleasant so I wonder if if the light is so downcast it doesn't illuminate the building at all or or whether it will in fact be lit by the Lights that are right, present. Right, above, right above the corner, right above where that entrance is between us and the bank, there's uh, some pretty major lighting right there uh, around the parking lot. It's very well lit. Uh, Perhaps somebody, and maybe I'll be walking there in the dark, you know, just notice if the light impinges on the sides of the building. Okay. Any other? Yeah, Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, I wondered if um, we have any um, observers who might have suggestions, something that we've entirely missed. Uh, I don't know if any hands have been raised in the audience, but if if there are, my, this might be a time to check with. We, we will we will get to public comment as soon as we're done with our discussion and, you, and, there, and that will be shortly, but we're trying to wrap up the discussion right now amongst board members and the, and the applicant. But I, I agree. It's always uh, helpful to have the public comment. Any more comments from the board? All right, let's see if there's public comments. And um, if you do have a comment you wish to make, please raise your hand. Um, and if so, uh, we'll call upon you with the help of the staff. When called upon, please state your name and address for the record um, and ad address your comments to the board and try to keep your comments to around three minutes. So, Mr. Chairman, we do, we, have, have, we do have one hand raised um, from Pamela yep. Rooney. Do you want me to make her talk? Okay. Yep. All righty. Bring her into the room. There you go. I think you could make me talk. <laughs> 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 Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. So I often come down Cottage Street and I cut right across to Prey Street because I don't 
Um, and I would not be able to see what kind of crowd was there until I get around the bend. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the traffic on that street. It, it is foot traffic that does worry me. Um, oftentimes when I come down Prey Street, I have to ease my way past people starting to queue up at spoke number one. Um, thank you for the question about when does the bus run? I'm not sure the answer, but that's a very good question. Um, so even though there may not be a lot of vehicle traffic on that street, uh, there also has never been a 560 person venue on that street before. So we don't really know the draw. We don't really know the Uber traffic, even to bring people there. Um, the, 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 you've all brought up some very, very good questions about the queuing and the noise outside. In terms of the queuing, what occurs to me is that at spoke number one, the queue is the sidewalk and that completely fills the public sidewalk, which we're expecting our high school people going downtown to use, we're expecting other people to use. Um, and that that is a concern. I have had to ease past people that spill out either coming across uh, East Pleasant Street or spilling off of the sidewalk um, on the north side of Prey Street. <clears throat> Um, the, the concern, another concern on the, this new side of the, of Prey Street, the south side of Prey Street, is that, again, queuing will be essentially filling that sidewalk. And so those of us who walk that side of the street, um, or anyone coming from East Pleasant Street to join the queue, will end up having to skirt the parked cars, which puts everybody literally everybody but the queue in jeopardy of, of the traffic. So it's probably not vehicular traffic, but pedestrian traffic that most concerns me. Um, if, there are, if there's a plan where Uber queuing can occur, that would be very helpful. Um, parking spaces, I know there are 32 spaces across the street. Um, I don't I don't know where the 20 number came from because uh, at that hour of night, um, I think I don't know. I don't know what's being occupied now, except those those folks that have the general permit that live in typically in in Kendrick Place. Um, trying to cover all my notes here. Number number one concern: never ever ever any outdoor dining or outdoor music, please. Um, number two, can somebody provide a comparison of the number of 560 patrons, compare it to what does the spoke, for, spoke number one currently um, contain? What are the other downtown dis, uh, uh, establishments like the Drake? I don't remember those numbers, but I think we should refresh our memory on that. All of those other places, perhaps except the Drake, are places that serve food and some alcohol. This is going to be a alcohol only pretty much um, establishment. And behavior, noise, all of that has to be, all of your management has to be commensurate with this alcohol only activity with a great deal of, a great number of people. I looked at the, looking now going inside, slight, um, uh, restrooms. Do, does that meet the state code? Does that meet the state code for drinking establishments? Again, with no food, it's not a restaurant where you, you know, use the restroom once. This is lots of lots of liquid, lots of volume. I lived in North Amherst, across from what is now the Harp, Mike's Westview Cafe. Notoriously, had people urinating outdoors all the time because they had insufficient. Um, um, restrooms in that facility. And we certainly don't want that happening in Kendrick Park. Um, you've talked about noise. Thank you for bringing that up. Again, it is the noise in the queues outdoors that concerns me the most uh, than, than the carefully managed indoor noise. So kindly consider that outdoor noise 
Um, and I, I look forward to more of that discussion about the seven inch curb, which is to keep people from stepping off uh, to the parking area as a normal walker. I, I totally understand the concerns raised about the, the emergency egress and hopefully you'll talk about that again. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Rooney. Any other comments from the public? All right, this is the opportunity for you, Mr. O'Rourke, to respond if you, if you need to. I mean, I, I know a lot of those subjects have already been discuss, discussed, but if you wish to respond to any of the public comments. Yeah, the bathroom, the bathroom. Now's your opportunity. The bathroom concern by Mrs. Ro by Ms. Rooney is um, done by uh, a code, and so the bath our capacity is determined by the bathrooms. So um, I can't have three stalls in a 500 person capacity. It doesn't work that way. Uh, the, the architect was hired to design um, design the capacity based on there, there's two things that come into play: the the, the bathrooms and then the square footage, uh, and, and the capacity determined based on that. Um, the bathrooms are sufficient to meet that capacity. So that's all done by code. Um, so uh, that hopefully will satisfy her, her concern on that, but it, but it is it, it is determined that way. Uh, there is a, an architectural uh, design board that's in place to, to design those uh, and, and meet those requirements. So so that that satisfies that. Um, as far as the capacity in the general area, uh, I mean, there's a great history of of that being there. There's 465 person capacity amongst the places that are no longer there. So um, we are seeking a greater capacity than what was there in the past. Um, and but the town has grown around that. The university has grown around that. But it is not unique to this area to have that patron capacity there uh, in a bar a bar format. Um, you know, Amherst Pub uh, was a restaurant by day, but at nighttime it was. Amherst Pub uh, in Old Town Tavern was a bar. And so again, if you look at the history of that of that area, we're not creating something that hasn't been there for uh, a you know a century. So it's not it's what's going on there is not unique to what's been there in the past. So that that's all on that matter. So what I'd like what I propose is that we um, run through the questions that and requests we had. Uh, come up with tonight. We review those now, um, share them with verbally, we'll share them with Mr. O'Rourke. And then we then Rob, you create a list for tomorrow and distribute that to the board and to Mr. O'Rourke. Make sure that we all are on the same page for uh, kind of a task of a list of things to have at our next meeting on this subject. So um, I don't know if Chris or Rob, who's who started to keep that list of requests for information or comments. Uh, I can always look back through it. Um, I just have to turn the page to my notes here. All right, so. So I believe most of them are brought up during the discussion phase of the meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so the. So I believe the first and most important was to have a plan on how to address the queuing outside in terms of people lining up and how much of the sidewalk is going to take. Um, another one was an amendment, to yeah, amendment to uh, the management plan. Yes, yeah, that's that correct. Would be an amendment to your management plan. And then uh, Vince brought up the indoor decibel level, um, negative impact on patrons inside. Um, how that should be addressed as well. I don't know if that was an amendment to the management plan or if that's something the applicant had to look into further. Um, the applicant has to look into. Especially for nightclubs and the levels that are produced inside the establishment. Um, Correct. Let's see. The chat has to follow up with the architect regarding um, how they calculated the um, number of patrons along the walkway, whether it was just done for half the sidewalk or if it was done for the full width of the sidewalk itself. Um, Dylan suggested having uh, Mr. O'Rourke um, provide a measurement of sound from outside the current spoke and bring that to the board at the next um, public hearing meeting for this permit. Um, and then Vince recommend us, the staff, to look into the two license suspensions for Panda East for underage drinking. Um, 
in terms of to see in terms Sarah, of the crowd reaction the crowd reaction my apologies yeah in, in terms of how they behaved once the police mm -hmm. entered the the establishment all right take a note of that all right the next 753 we had sarah mentioning that the management plan should address uh what the bouncers should do in an emergency evacuation situation, how they're going to direct the crowd when they're exiting the building. Um, the way. In regards to the uh, curbing, the applicant should discuss with the property management group and your architect um, about how to address that in front of the entrance points. Um, it was discussed that the railing may not be the best idea from Dave who brought that up. Um, might be wise to just eliminate the curb in front of the egress points so you prevent people from tripping over it as they're exiting in a um, panic. And then we also have so the traffic study didn't really seem necessary from the board, but that is something that you could consider as a condition if there's a problem that arises. Um, bus schedule, which we'll provide, that was requested from Vince. Uh, getting info for ride share availability for the Prey Street area. I don't know how we're going to do that for just Prey Street specifically. I feel like companies like that will probably only provide it for the whole town. Yeah. But I can always look into it for, for the sake of this permit. Um, and then photographs that are timestamp over the next few weeks showing what that area looks like. I believe it was in regards to the ride share line as well as what the crowds look like. Um, I believe, Sarah, you brought that point up, correct? Well, yeah, the crowds, but also someone mentioned just is the are the parking lots in fact empty? Yeah. Just how yes. empty are they? Yeah. All right. Just what does it look like at ten o'clock at night? Just, right. What does it look like on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, ten o'clock at night? That's all. We, that gives us an idea, right? Yeah. All right. And then we have. Um, the applicant should amend the management plan to address the fire department comments that were submitted after the management plan was um, sent in to us. Um, I believe, Steve, I brought up the design review board conditions that should be implemented. It seems like the directional sign may be unnecessary in this case, but I don't know if you would rather address that at the next um, hearing, Mr. Chairman. No, I, I think we'll just, we'll leave it up to the, what the, what, the, what, we'll, what I think we should do is, mm -hmm. Put in our conditions the yep. design review board <laughs> requirements mm -hmm. and if they say just consider we don't have to go beyond that okay what they if they decide us that just about a sign and they should mm -hmm. consider it that's all we have to do we don't have to require that okay um let's see what else and sarah i believe brought up um we should determine if the lighting on the sides of the building are good enough to light up those alleyways. I believe it was on the left side as well as the right side of the building. Am I correct on that? Oh, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> sorry, not the alleyways, but mm -hmm. are the the where the signs will go? Where the signs are those will go. Area is illuminated already. Mm -hmm. Do we? Is there in fact a need for illumination? Yeah. And so, other, one, so just one other thing was the was the um uh give some context for the air ex the uh, air exchange if if they can be gotten from umass or from local schools or whatever where they have similar um areas the enclosed areas with large numbers of people um post pandemic so we have a, a context into which the the applicant's proposal uh, can be fit or compared. So, my code requirement, though, on that? Yeah, I'm not, it's code not like it's exchange, air exchange. Yeah, I understand that there's code requirements, um, but I'd like, to, um, I'd like to know what others have done and what, and what you propose to do and see how that, I mean, I, I would expect that the likelihood is not, not all of the, um, the examples are going to be um, the same. And we, we'd be good to have some kind of sense of what other businesses and institutions are doing with enclosed large capacity spaces. All right. Uh, 
capacity spaces. All right, then we have public comment section. Um, there was one thing that was brought up by uh, Ms. Rooney. I don't know if the board wants to consider adding this as well, but it was in regards to comparing the 566 patrons versus the number of nearby establishments. Um, I don't remember specifically what that comparison is for. I don't know if it's just determine um, what that would look like in regards to the spoke mean open at nighttime, like what that crowd would be in terms of size as compared to the other businesses in the area. Um, I believe Sarah, you have your hand up. Well, I think an earlier request maybe from Mr. Judge mm -hmm. might address that in part. And that was to get some, no I think somebody, some noise measurements uh, out where the, where the current cues yeah. form. So yeah. I believe I have um, a sense I just, of just how noisy are just how noisy are these people when they're, when they're waiting to get it. So I believe I addressed that I, I, at oh, an earlier point as well. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't. No, it's okay. I'm, I'm glad you. But I, I think it, I think was I think Mr. O'Rourke responded to at least part of Ms. Roney's request, which was mm -hmm. how many people, how many, how big a um, facility was existed there before with the two establishments that are now gone. And then I think Ms. Rooney said, wanted to know about how large are other places in town. Um, and I think that's information that's readily available by the license, by the licensing board about how large the uh, capacity is for various places on Pleasant Street. I think that's what, I think that would satisfy her request. Okay. But I'd be, I'd be, I mean, but, but, but I, you know, that's, it would be interesting for us to have as well. Okay. So you would want yeah, to know the um, number of businesses in the immediate area that have crowds of similar size. Is that correct? No, just how big is, you know, what, what's the capacity for Bistro 63? What's the capacity for the bar next to it? Okay. What's the capacity for, you know, that's, that's what we're looking for. for and what's the, what was the capacity? Yeah. For the Drake was another one. And what was the, what was the capacity of the two places that left that no longer are there? And you mentioned it already, Mr. O'Rourke and, um, if you could just give it to Rob right now, I bet we could solve part of that uh, information request. You knew what it was, I think. 465. But between that, the two of them. Yeah I, yeah, I believe so. I'd have to go back and look into that. Okay. I think um, I, okay. that was a book record and it can be obtained. I can All check right. with um, Mr. McCarthy tomorrow and see if he has that information yep. available. They'd have that. And then that's that's all I had on my list. I mean, was there anything that I missed? So, yeah. That's pretty much it. We can, you can review the, the tape. Review the tape tomorrow and see if there's something else. But I think you've got a pretty good list. Miss Brushbrook. I just wanted to say that Rob and I will put our heads together tomorrow and go through our notes. And if we come up with anything else, we'll um, make sure that we include it in the list. Okay. Sounds great. That sounds great. All right. So what I would like to do is uh, continue this public hearing until a later date and um chris when is the next open meeting is it next week or is it what well, the next meeting we have which does not have an agenda or does not have a full agenda I believe, I believe it is that would be may 11th is that right rob yep so um the 27th of april already has a public hearing scheduled may 11th does not have anything scheduled that we're yeah. aware of okay okay hold on a second Okay, let's, it gives us about three, a little over three weeks to almost a month to do that. So um, I move that we continue this public, I would accept the motion to continue this public hearing until May 11th. So move to 6 p.m. Yep, 6 p.m. Thursday, May Normal 11th. place and time, right. So moved, um, is there a motion a second? I'll second it. Mr. Maxfield seconds. Is there any discussion on that motion? The only discussion I've had is I'm, I am uh, inclined, I think this is a, a really good um, idea and I think it's something we'd be able to, I appreciate working with the, the applicant and the way we've gone through it today. And I think that this has real, pretends real uh, benefit for the town. And I think you've been very, um, um, responsive to some of the requests of the board. So I'm looking favorably upon this at this time, um, but I'd like to see the rest of this information and 
make sure we can work through with the conditions that we've been talking about. Um, and some of those may make uh, all of us more comfortable. Um, so that's my, my discussion about this motion. Anybody else? If not, it's a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. O'Connor? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Motion carries. All right, we'll see you on May 11th. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye. The next order of business um, is public comment on anything not before the board tonight. Is there any? Is there any public members of the public who wishes to speak on a subject not before the board tonight? I do not see anybody uh, raising their hand. The last order of business is anything that has not come up in the last forty-eight hours, and I guess. The one thing I would like to talk about would be the upcoming meetings. So we have one on the twenty uh, seventh. And what is that? So um, just to give some background, that's for a permit on Sunderland Road. Um, the project is for uh, battery storage. So BSS. It's um, I'm not sure of the specifics of mm -hmm. the size of the facility. I still have to create the PR for that. Um, I believe there's Rob, if I'm not mistaken, there's eight units that's going in on that site. Is that correct? And um, I believe uh, they already went to Concom. Um, they have an order of conditions with them. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the time frame is for the order of conditions to be met, but it would be wise to consider those for our hearing as well, because a lot of them um, address site specific issues and concerns, um, especially with. Um, runoff from rainstorms, et cetera. But that is what's coming up on the 27th. And then one more thing, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to bring to your attention is that we do have some pending uh, 40B permits in the near future. Uh, we're seeing some that mm -hmm. are probably gonna come up over the summer. So KP Law, we did meet with them uh, yesterday to discuss these permits and they suggested um, maybe coming to one of the ZBA meetings or having a time during the week that works for everyone to train the board, the entire board, including alternates, on the 4B process, just so everybody's familiar with what the role of the board is, uh, what to expect. Um, these hearings tend to take several meetings. So usually you address certain specific aspects of the permit over maybe the course of four to five separate hearings, um, what the responsibilities of the board would be um, and educate everyone. So all eight members, I believe, no, sorry, nine members. So if people have to step in, those people will know what to do in a sense. So I, I wanted to bring it to the board's attention. I also sent up a follow-up email tomorrow um, just to make everybody aware of it. Um, I think that's something the board should consider discussing as well. Yeah, I'd say that uh, having been through only one 40B, it was um, a long process. It's different than our normal special permit process or variance process. Um, and our role is a little different. So I think it's a great idea for training from, um, and I would encourage that we do that. If, you know, we should do that on a, if we have to, we could do it on a regular Thursday, Thursday meeting. But um, I would also, that's, I think we have an awful lot of um, things and uh, project applications uh, coming up before us in the near future. And we may not wanna be taking up um, meeting time, Thursday, meet, Thursday night meeting time with a training session. So I would suggest that maybe we should survey the members to see what other either evening, uh, probably evening, we could do some of that training on and not take up a Thursday night. Yeah. And I know it would have to be a public, it'd be a public meeting still, we'd have to notice right. it and all that, but it would still be, it would, it would make sense not to use up one of our Thursday nights, I think, if we could do that, Rob. Sounds good. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I would just note that there's like, well, certainly possible there'll be turnover of this board at the end of June. Mm -hmm. so may want to wait yeah. to have the new folks or you know maybe everyone's re-upping we don't know but <laughs> just something to consider i think some terms are ending i know all the, I have all, found... I mean, all the associates are are just one year terms so i have i have found that your term is i think uh, correct me if i'm wrong chris or rob but i think your term goes until a replacement is found is that correct are the, associate, uh, are the associate members 
the alternate member is still a member until a replacement is found, or does their term end on June 30th? It depends on the interpretation. Um, when this happens, we usually reach back to KP Law and ask them what is their recommendation, but it also um, relates to how the town council feels. And um, so we'll have yeah. to investigate that. Um, the last time I went through this, um, the decision was made that when your term ends, your term ends, and that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, though, I've experienced people continuing on with certain cases as long as they're on the panel and they're allowed to continue. So we'll have to get back to you on that um, topic. Yep, good point. Okay, uh, Mr. Maxfield. Yeah, I was just going to say, it uh, looks like I'm going to be starting a new job uh, next week that uh, will involve evenings. So I, at this time, it, it, it looks like this, this may be, I might be joining in with the turnover, unfortunately, and not doing a second term. Uh, it's all still in the works right now. If I can, if I can swing it, I, I, I would love to join you guys for one more, especially, you know, not leave you as the, the only, uh, one of the only members on here who's done 40B in the past, but uh, we'll see as it currently stands, it's, it's, it's looking like I, I may be departing in, uh, in June. Well, I hate to hear that, Dylan, um, but I, I'm happy, it must be a good job. And I'm happy if that's the case, if you got something that you want to do, that's a, that's a, that makes me feel good about it. That's a, more important. But um, especially this last, I thought you did a great job chairing this last uh, meeting. I, um, I noticed, I saw part of it, you did a good job and, and I, I've enjoyed you being part of this uh, board. So it's it's nothing. It nothing us, we'd love it. Nothing's official yet, and once I once I truly know, I'll we might be able to. We can do our our proper goodbyes then. So thinking about it, that's well, the, we, the direction it's heading. It looks like, but wait, maybe wait till it's official. Uh, yeah, we don't want to jinx it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. Okay. Anybody else have any old? Any other business that uh, any old business scheduling? Anything else we need to go over? Good enough. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? One yeah. last comment before we go. I just wanted to point it out. Uh, I do appreciate the uh, we've got the the mustachioed crew here tonight on the board. We're taking over the maturity <laughs> now. So gotta gotta enjoy it while we have it. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, while it's still the same color as your hair, too. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else? No. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So, is there a second? I hear a second. Uh, the motion is not debatable and it requires a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. O'Connor? Aye. And Mr. Sloviter? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, guys. And uh, we got seven minutes before nine. <laughs> Good timing.